Guys, intro time. Wait, which intro? The wisdom check. Oh, good. Wait, no. I thought we were keeping the old intro. What's wrong with the old one? People like that one. It was too long. Yeah. Too many fucking gifts. Yeah. 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 But can we keep the part where I yell <gasps> more? Oh, no. 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 But it's the intro to end all intros. I got like what? Two lines last time? Do you want more lines, Tim? Well, no, not really. <laughs> In a world without answers. Uh, yeah. Wait, do you want to start with that? Here we go. Exactly like last time. Wait, OK, so we're doing the exact same way. Let's start with the Smoky Bar. No, yeah. no, it's a new season. We have to have a new intro. More. Yeah. Not sure why we thought this could go any differently. Oh well. Uh, welcome everyone to the Wisdom Check, where Jeff and Dustin welcome a guest every week to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Welcome. This is ridiculous. I'm starting the stream now. Wait, wait, where's my die at? Well, we can't start until I botch, and it's not an intro unless I'm botching. You're on. Alright, we should be live. Welcome, everyone, to the Wisdom Check. I am Dustin, and on the far side of the screen, where he is usually positioned, is Jeff. Hey, hey. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for that uh, raid over there, Lindy. Much appreciated. Yeah, Welcome, streamers. Thank you, Lindy. What was I eating? I was eating some cheese sticks and some summer sausage. It is the <laughs> dinner of champions. So you must know. I just got off work literally 22 minutes ago, so this has been quickly having to be thrown back together. But yes, thank you, Lindy, for the raid and the 21 who've come along with Lindy. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. This is your first time here. Give us a like or a follow. And uh, yeah, summer sauce is just the best. You're quite right there, Quail DV. <laughs> so um, with us today, we have the ST, because that's what you use when you're talking about World of Darkness games, ST. It's not a DM, it's not a GM, it's an ST. Um, we have the ST of the Untold Stories Project's Werewolf game that actually took place right before our show tonight. So already after a few hours of streaming and running game, he's here to talk with us. It's Jonesy. Jonesy, say hi to everybody out there. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Much appreciate you coming. I know it's been oh, a, thanks. probably a long day for you. <laughs> but it's, it's all good. That's what caffeine's for, right? <laughs> Amen. Hey, thanks for the follow there, JRC. Much appreciated. No. If you're, a, if you're an avid uh, viewer of the Wisdom Check, you know that we had a good friend of ours, Malice, on, and we talked some vampire, uh, mm -hmm. what was it, like February, right before the whole quarantine, like, seems like forever ago. A now. lifetime ago, yeah. But earlier this year, we already talked a little werewolf, and during that time when we talked some werewolf, or, or sorry, we didn't talk werewolf, we talked vampire. <laughs> we talked vampire, we talked a bit about the world of darkness in general. Um, if you're an avid viewer and you watch that, you might get a little rehash of a little bit of that tonight as we talk about Werewolf with Jonesy. Now, as I mentioned in that conversation with Malice, Werewolf holds a special place in my, my cold, dead, unbeating heart. Because while I played more Vampire than I played Werewolf, Werewolf was my first World of Darkness game. Mm -hmm. It was my bridge from Dungeons & Dragons into, into these more horror-themed adult games, and I've had a love for them ever since, and it was Werewolf is what got me started. So I was super hyped to find out that somebody was running a werewolf. I get to watch it, and I'm going to get to talk to him. So thanks for being here, Jonesy. And we're going to get a little talking here about how you got into the hobby and werewolf in general. So why don't you why don't you kick us off and tell us how you got into just the hobby in general? Um, so long ago in the before time, um, my 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 father made the mistake of picking up the red box, the original red box set of Dungeons and Dragons, for me at the base uh, toy shop in Germany. Uh, oh, and, nice! Uh, uh, when we were stationed over there, I was a military brat, and so that was my my first like foray into RPGs. Um, funnily enough, it wasn't the one I ended up playing the most of <laughs> at the time. Uh, my buddies also shortly afterwards got Star Frontiers, and so I spent far more time. Um, running around as a Dralocyte playing Star Frontiers than I ever did as, a, as a, an elf raiding a dungeon any, at the time, at least. That has changed, changed but yeah, that was my uh, my first taste of RPGs. Awesome. What was your early gaming group like? I mean, do you kind of gel around other students, or I mean, what was the situation there? Yeah, so uh, um, 
since I wasn't a base, everyone else was military brats. And so I ended mm-hmm. up playing with a couple of, a, a couple of the other guys in the, the building we were living in. Um, they lived upstairs, and that's, that's the couple of people I'd play with. And we played a little bit when I was uh, younger. Then I kind of find, fell out of the hobby for a while as we got moved from base to base. And it wasn't until I got into high school that I, I fell back in as a... Uh, uh, Shortly after the start of my freshman year in high school, I mm-hmm. looked over at the back of the ROTC class, and one of the guys was was uh, making a champion's character. <laughs> you know, and it's I'm interesting. Like, What's that? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's interesting. There always there, there seems to be a pretty strong connection between uh, military folks and gaming, and I'm not I'm not sure what the connection is, but it seems like a lot of people I know who are into gaming are also military people. Well, at least for me, it was the consistency. Uh, it's the mm-hmm. same reason I fell into comics. Because, well, at least when I was a brat, because I was a, a military kid, not a, 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 I never enrolled, but I was a military kid, mm-hmm. so I moved from base to base to base. Mm-hmm. So it was something that went with me, as opposed to... Um, Makes sense. I mean, most, most of my youth was in Germany, so we didn't have Saturday morning cartoons. We didn't have... Uh, we had one TV station. One uh, TV arm- station? Wow. It was the Armed Forces and Radio Television Network, which is basically the cherry picks of, of ABC, NBC, and CBS kind of thrown together in a blender. Uh, and it oh, didn't start sense. until 9 o'clock, in Saturday, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, at least when I was a kid. It's since, obviously, they have cable and stuff now. But uh, So that was what I had. I mean, I had comic books, and then eventually I had RPGs, thanks to, to Dungeons and Dragons. So, wow. So that, that was, that was my, my youth. Uh, I, I got to watch Saturday morning cartoons for one year when I was in third grade. Um, <laughs> oh boy, oh, man! <laughs> then, uh, That's crazy. Uh, which is great. I loved it. I mean, that was a, that was the summer that, uh, that they were running the Judges of Dragons cartoon, so it was it was a double win for me. Um, nice. But yeah, man, that is a different start for sure. Like I, I don't know how many people in our chat have had that experience, but. Uh, it's it's a good one. I could see why you were you're ready to go with gaming when it it popped in. So, um, how long did it take you to before you kind of stumbled into the the world of darkness kind of stuff? Uh, so uh, in high school, most of the stuff we lived and breathed was champions. Um, mm-hmm. uh, in college is when I stumbled into the world of darkness. Um, uh, I've been off and on. I've been talking to my old high school buddy. He's talking about this awesome game where me and my friends are playing, and we, we're all gonna play vampires, and it's a modern day, and blah blah. blah. I'm like it's really cool. Uh, and then uh, sounds really neat. I was a huge horror buff as a kid. I loved um, Fright Night and Lost Boys and all that stuff. Uh, Interview with the Vampire. I loved mm-hmm. all that stuff. And uh, uh, my go-to movie as a kid was my parents took me to go see The Omen. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Omen? Uh, the original The Omen, uh, and oh, wow. the, my mom my mom took me to go see Psycho 2 when it first premiered, and yeah, so my parents sh- did not shy away from letting me see horror movies as a kid, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, That's so, a little bit of influence, huh? <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, in college, though, when my roommate in college bought first edition Werewolf the Apocalypse, mm-hmm. he's like, we're going to play this, so I'm like, really? We're going to play, but it's like, I, I, I get it's the same thing, but we can't play vampire instead. And he's like, no, I'm going to run werewolf because he was a big <laughs> werewolf fan. And so that was my first experience in the world of darkness was, um, him playing him running a, a werewolf, the apocalypse game where we literally made characters who didn't know squat about the world of darkness. We made people mortals and nice. we learned the setting. We learned the setting as we learned the, as our characters learned the setting. So, um, I hope so. didn't have to, yeah, we didn't have to worry about, I don't know about enough about this or that. I'm like, well, your characters don't either, so don't worry about it. And, right. yeah. Because, man, there is a lot of lore to dive into <laughs> when you get into these games. Now, that's kind of true, I think, of, you know, World of Darkness games in general. But Werewolf is a whole beast of its own. Uh, you know, there's the spirit world. You know, we're going to talk about with the Umbra. You know, you've got kind of... Um, the duality aspect already baked into the cake, obviously, with a you know being part werewolf kind of situation. Um, and you got all these like moral issues that kind of come up into play. So like all this stuff is just like jam packed, ready for you to start with. And I don't know for some players, I can imagine that's pretty overwhelming. Uh, I know when we were getting started, we obviously probably missed a lot of it, <laughs> you know, trying to learn how to play the game. Um, probably in retrospect, would have been smarter for us to all play as a uh, you know fresh people who had no clue what was going on as well but i think we dove in as actual just 
people who knew what was up <laughs> stumbled our way through it. Well, I know our early games, we had played a lot of D&D. &D, mm -hmm. And this was, like I said, Werewolf was our first venture into the world of darkness. So we, we treated it like D&D. &D. So, you know, it was, we had a pack of five or six. We did a lot of missions into the Umbra to go kill some monsters, do some stuff, make our way back. So it was a good bridge game to get into world of darkness. But I don't know if I can say that we ever treated the lore 110% fairly at the time that we were playing them. But that's why I've always wanted to go back and try it again. Like as, yeah. as more mature adult players, like, but it still, still holds, <laughs> like I said, a, a, a very warm place in my heart for, for the, for this game in particular. So. Now, do you remember what your, your first characters were? Do you remember if it was like, like oh. the actual splats and everything were? Uh, I don't remember all the stats off the top of my head, but I could go downstairs and dig them up. Um, <laughs> I still have them. Uh, fun first edition. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a Glasswalker Hamid Theurge. Uh, and, nice. um, and he started off as a mobster hitman. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, and... Uh, he may or may not have broken the litany on more than one occasion. So, <laughs> so if you're in the chat and you're hearing these words and you're thinking, I have no idea what that means. That's what we're talking about. There's a lot that goes into this. Um, there's a lot of complexity in your characters. You got a lot of things that kind of define them. And then you have this whole culture uh, that the werewolves live in that has their own laws and rules and organizational structures and everything else. And it's, it's a lot. It's really freaking cool. <laughs> um, yeah. We can get into some of that too, but go ahead. Yeah, there's actually a picture of my character getting taken out uh, in one of the old modules. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a shot. There's a shot of our original pack in one of the old modules. Uh, a buddy of mine. I was going to art school at the time, and a buddy of mine ended up getting a job doing uh, freelance art for for White Wolf at the time. No kidding. So, uh, nice. well, that's so pretty cool. So my character actually showed up there, and I'm like, of course, mine's the one getting attacked. Uh, Naturally, like, yeah, because I was the that was the damage magnet. I really was. Everyone, somebody has to be in every party, and it's you know, it's sad when it's you. <laughs> now, uh, some of the stuff that we were talking about there, uh, you, you were saying you're a glasswalker, right? So that's that's one of the tribes in the uh, in, in the group of werewolves, and there are a ton of them. And I I was kind of thinking earlier when I was in your stream. 13. Yeah, 13 was the number. I was, I was trying to go through. playable tribes, we should say. There were a few extras that were not so playable. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to go through and see if I remember them all. But uh, that's another thing that the uh, the World of Darkness did, is it always had a way of kind of subdividing heavily on themes. And so, like, in the, in the werewolf world, you had a lot of things you could potentially be involved in. Now, did you kind of stick to Glasswalker, or were you kind of drawn to other ones more as you kind of continued playing? Well, that was the the big one I played for the first the first big campaign um, mm -hmm. that we played in our, our freshman and sophomore year of, of college. Our, our final year of college, we ended up doing something slightly different, in, still in the same uh, World of Darkness vein, but we ended up jumping around. There was a specific NPC um, who I'm going to be a little vague about um, because <laughs> he may, may or may not show up and one of my players may or may not be listening, but... Mm -hmm. um, he, he's, a, he's a notorious pain and a thorn in the World of Darkness's side, and people love to hate him. Um, anyway, we uh, the, the GM, at the, or Stest at the time, ended up running a bunch of uh, one-shots where we basically tracked this character around. When, so he ran a vampire game where we we dealt with them, and then he ran a mage game where we dealt with them, and we ran you know, a couple other things. And, um, and, and this is the sad part. I'm pretty sure I know who it is just based off of that tiny bit of description. <laughs> that's the saddest part about it. And that, mm -hmm. that's one of the cool things about, um, about werewolf probably more than any of the other world of darkness games. It was, there was so much of the werewolf lore that was built around like name characters from the mm -hmm. setting itself, like more so than I can remember with vampire, like vampire had Beckett, the gangrel. And you could read the novels and stuff where Beckett the Gangrel was going and doing his thing. I think it was Beckett, if I remember correctly. Yep, but, yeah, um, yeah. quite a few. Yeah. There, there was a few others from novels and stuff, but like it didn't infiltrate into the books the same way that, that King Albert and Evan Heals the Past and these characters did for Werewolf. Like mm -hmm. they were, every book was mainstream, you know, um, 
Maricabra, those those uh, those characters were just essential core to to the werewolf mythos, and they were currently existing characters. Whereas a lot of the vampire um, mythos was based around native Diluvians that you were never going to see. <laughs> so it was well, hopefully. So it, that's always been one of the cool things about werewolf is that it's it, it seemed like a more livable, touchable lore than sometimes what you got with vampire. Yeah, definitely. Uh, part of the thing is with the vampire, those were most mostly the named characters were, were elders and, and mm-hmm. high up in the clans and stuff. Right. And they usually only associate with other elders and high ups, whereas in werewolf, it wouldn't be uncommon for uh, one of the high ups to go, hey, I, I got a job for you. Can you I, mean, I need you to go, you know, go explore here or go deal with that or follow up on this lead because I've got other things I need to do. But it's rather critical that we know about X or Y or you know, whatever. So. Yep. So, our for your game that you're running on Untold Stories Project, uh, it sounds like you're going to be using maybe some of these characters and some of that lore from from the books. Are you are you running out of a set from the books and out of some of the setting, like directly, like the people who know the lore? Are they going to be able to hop right in because of that? Yeah. So the initial uh, season one, we're running. Uh, I'm basically running uh, the pack, our new players, our pack, through uh, a rite of passage. Mm. And they act, they actually started off in New York City, being brought into the the, the Sept of the Green, meeting, and they met with Mother Larissa and several other of the 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 elders in the the Sept and are being sent on their mission. So, uh, they're they're right. Um, and so Sept, I'm, of, Sept of the Green puts you smack dab Central Park. Yes, mm-hmm. that's the heart. It's the, the shadowy heart in the central uh, in the center of yeah, the, the New York City. Um, Partially because I'm in love with that sept. That's the sept I. That was the sept. I was my home sept when I was a, a, an initial a newbie cub player cub. Uh, so <laughs> that's um, awesome. There's a lot of coming home in the game too. Like I think that's a, another theme of Werewolf that's really interesting is that there's, you know, the pack is so important. The sept is really important. The traditions are very important. There's like all these things that tie like a community together. And so, like, you can really dig into those sorts of steps, you know, and kind of feel like the living soul of, of a group of people. Yeah, and one of the bonuses I had with the Sept of the, uh, the, Sept of the Green in New York City was I told the players they didn't have to be from New York. But it, there's multiple reasons why someone might be in New York when they go, and that could, they could be there when they went through their first change. And so they were the nearest Sept, so that was the Sept that took them in. Because I wanted to give the players lots of options about what kind of background they came from, where they're, you know, mm-hmm. where they're from, how, you know, one of the, the players in our, our current stream is uh, a character who was born and raised in Dublin, Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was over visiting at the time. So, uh, so I wanted to kind of open that, that. And so New York seemed like a good fit mm-hmm. uh, with having um, that as a backdrop to start the game. So. Yeah. No, no, you, New York is interesting because you have, you have Ellis Island, you have immigration. You've got a very large mixing pot of a lot of different cultures. And one of the things that Werewolf is both good about and notorious for is that a lot of the tribes are very heavily influenced by a particular culture that exists in our real world because it's a mm-hmm. real world setting. So like your silent striders are Egyptian themed. You don't have to be Egyptian to be a silent strider, but at some level, to connect with that tribe, you're going to get into some Egyptian culture. When you mm-hmm. deal with um, the stargazers, for instance, um, you're dealing with with the Japanese culture because they, they hail from the Japanese area. So you can have all these things in a city like New York, and that's really the best way to handle mm-hmm. that is then you can be, you can bring those pieces of culture with you into it and still be in this like large city setting. So how are you handling some of the cultural aspects of the werewolf tribes? Well, yeah, I'm uh, definitely playing that up a little bit. We do have a, a mixed pack. Uh, I've got uh, a pack of four they're running through. Um, so we did have the, the girl from Dublin, Ireland, who's who's uh, Fianna. She's uh, of the Fianna tribe, which normally hails from Ireland. Uh, we have a glass walker. Um, we have a, a silent strider um, uh, who kind of just uh, stumbled into things. Uh, and then we have a, a get a Fenris. Uh, so we're, I'm gonna, I'm playing with some of that a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna play with more as the game goes on. It's uh. very cool. Yeah, that's because there's a lot of things that World of Darkness likes to play in some like uh, some gray areas. We'll say, I guess you know, the World of Darkness by its nature is a little touchy. 
little edgy here and there. So there's there's some things that are a little rough around the edges. Um, you know, there's some biases I think are baked into the cake with some of these tribes. Have you, have you ever had any trouble dealing with some of those things as they come up in the game? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I pretty much, uh, I mean, I had some occasions um, dealing with some players uh, in general, uh, as opposed to players in my game. Um, but I have a, yeah, so there are going to be some antagonists, um, like, the get, like one of the go-tos is the, the Geta Fenris hate the um, the Black Furies, and the Black Furies hate the Geta Fenris. I'm like, mm-hmm. not all Black Furies hate the Geta Fenris, and not all Geta Fenris hate the Black Furies, and, and especially, and as I progress the timeline a little bit, I'm like, you know, especially now that all this crap's going down, um, mm-hmm. a lot of those biases are, are breaking down somewhat uh, because the numbers are getting so thin. So I kind of, I, I pretty much have, uh, have said to players, you kind of really, you know, kind of play that down a little bit as far yeah. as among, at least among the pack, among the pack. Um, to that Feel point, like I, to. <laughs> yeah, there, there was one, one tribe I wouldn't allow in the beginning of the game. Uh, and that was the, the red talons just because they're, they're so tied to nature, and I was doing a New York City game. And That'd be hard to do. Yeah, it, it really put them on edge, and, and I felt as a, as a player disadvantage, and also just um, some of the, the the animosity between them and the other tribes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, for some of you guys in chat that may not know, uh, when you make a character for this game, um, there, are, there there are certain things about you that are going to be kind of uh, defining. So like one of those things has to do with your your tribe. One of them is the the sign of the moon, the, the phase of the moon when you're going through your change. Called an auspice. Because mm-hmm. we're going to say it at some point, so it's called an auspice. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come up. There's a, there's a whole thing of importance there. Uh, but then the last one is what type you were before you changed. So you could have been Hamid, which meant you were like us, you know, run-of-the-mill humans that went about their day until one day something really weird happened and you turned into a werewolf. Um, but there's also Lupus, who started off life as a wolf, and then came into things as like a, a pseudo-human kind of situation. So life is going to be very different for them. And the red talons that we were just talking about are all Lupus. Um, so they come at it from nature first, primal animal, and so the whole human existence is strange and foreign to them. So that's why it can go wrong. And there's another one, the Metis, but we're we're going to save that for later. <laughs> I got my I guess my current we need to make sure everyone is aware of is that werewolf is unique that being a werewolf is not a curse you're 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 Mm. born it is a genetic thing that's passed down so these are family lineages these tribes are thus kind of family lineages and you you have the gene then that turns you when you hit puberty basically you kick into werewolf form and you become this you find out you're this whole other thing so it's it's because a lot of people when they hear werewolf they think it's like oh man you've been cursed like vampirism right and that's not true vampires are a curse in world of darkness but it's it's not the case for werewolves so um so get so that is it's like i said those are things that you have to go through character creation to figure out is is whether your what your breed is if you're homet or lupus or metis if you're auspice there's five auspices for the five different moon phases and they all play different roles and then 13 tribes so there's a lot of combinations there that give you some some room to play with so when you're dealing with forming a pack for your games do you do you have them create their characters together as a group so that they're covering different bases or do you like them to do it individually and then come together as a pack through whatever you throw at them so i've done it a couple different ways uh the way i did it for the stream was we did have a, a session zero where i kind of talked and laid out some of the plans and, and kind of like the, what the goal was as far as like this is the kind of story we're going to tell that you're all new cubs you're just going through your first change you don't have to know a whole lot so that you have a similar experience like you you as a player don't have to stress that you don't know enough about the setting because your character won't know a whole lot about the setting um, but I did kind of encourage, I would like to see multiple tribes, I would like to see multiple auspices, because, specifically because it is a streaming game, and I wanted to kind of get uh, showcase multiple aspects of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my last big uh, tabletop campaign I just did on, with me and my friends, um, I didn't tell them we were playing Werewolf. I told them we were playing a World of Darkness game. Ah, the and- old switcheroo. <laughs> and I'm like, we're playing some World of Darkness game, and I need you to make up a character. 
a mm-hmm. human character, and I gave him a whole list of random stuff. I need them. I like. I need this. I need this. I need to know, you know, where you're from. I need to know, like, what is your family line, uh, ancestry like. Um, I need to know, and then, um, like, what is your date of birth? You know, um, <laughs> and I gave him some other some other questions, definitely to kind of obscure yep. which version of they were playing, and they kind of mm-hmm. had a guess, but because they knew me, but um, yeah. <laughs> so then I then I said, okay, cool. This is what's going on. Blah blah. blah. We went through, and then we did like a, a little prelude thing where we talked about, okay, here's here's you know this is your tribe, this is your whatever, um, yeah. And some of them were a little bit of a surprise to one player as he found out. I'm like, you're a, a, a um, you're not a sh- you're not a shadow lord. You are a uh, class walker. What? I'm like, yep. <laughs> uh, well, surprise. Uh, he was trying really hard to go for a specific try because he suspected what i was doing and then i uh said nope here you go <laughs> it's a pretty big swing in culture too so uh, oh, maybe we should uh, describe some of the tribes to people since uh i have a feeling there's a lot of people in our chat that are unfamiliar with werewolf yeah uh, we, we kind of talked about the breeds being either mm-hmm. human born or or being uh wolf born so the next natural step then is let's just cover the five auspices and then we'll kind of get into some of the tribes so go ahead and tell us a little about the five different auspices of werewolves sure uh so uh, as was mentioned uh the sign of that sign of the moon that your character is born under kind of uh, indicates a little bit about um what your character's natural inclination is uh mm-hmm. i say natural inclination because um people do kind of vary a little bit depending on, on what they're playing mm-hmm. but uh the uh, we'll start with uh, the new moon and work our way up. So the the new moon, the born under the brand new moon of the of the cycle, um, are referred to as Ragabash. They're kind of like the tricksters. They they take a cue from from Loki and the coyote, and uh, are definitely uh, the the uh, stickers of like, hey, what's going on? Um, and uh, and our uh, our one Ragabash current Ragabash player is definitely living up to that, which is quite quite <laughs> hilarious. Um, and then we move to the crescent moon, which is uh, the theurge, which are um, mm-hmm. kind of the wisdom, spiritual nature uh, asp- uh, auspice. Because uh, werewolves are uh, creatures of both flesh and spirit. They can actually travel between the, the umbra, the spirit realm, and then the physical world itself. They're actually twin dualities in that sense. And so the uh, theurges are really talented at dealing with and tra- uh, trafficking with spirits. Um, then we have the uh, half moon, which is um, kind of the auction. judges. Yeah, the, the judges. They're kind of responsible for overseeing the guru law, which is rather complex. Uh, it can be rather complex or very straightforward, depending on who you're asking and what the specific question is. Um, and then uh, you move up to the uh, the quarter moon, the, the gibbous moon, the three quarters moon, and that's the the uh, galliards, the 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 lore keepers, the the keepers of the song, um, uh, totally not bards. I mean, except that they totally are bards. So um, they're the bards, <laughs> except people uh, hate it when they say that, but it's the bards. <laughs> um, and our Fiana and our and our pack is a, a, a galliard, so it's pretty fitting. Um, and then you get all the way up to the the the, the full moon, which is the traditionally uh, what people associate werewolves with and there's a reason for that because it's also the the krinos uh the, the sorry the <laughs> arun it's been a long day um arun uh, auspice which is the base of the warriors the, the basically main defenders the big fighter types of mm-hmm. the Gru. and since the moon and the face the face of the moon can also impact your character's chances of going frenzy and freaking out uh it tends to happen more often under the full moon which kind of leads to some of the why humans assume, oh, where will transform under the light of the full moon? Well, they can transform whatever they want. They're just more prone to freaking out around unsuspecting mortals <laughs> under the light of the full moon. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of almost like if you're familiar with classes from Dungeons and Dragons, they kind of are similar in that you kind of have these different roles in society. You do get some additional abilities that are kind of based off of that. Um, but it's not quite as uh, cut and dry. So, you know, just because you're an Arun doesn't mean that you're always, you know, guy fighter. You, you know, you can have different personality right. traits to kind of go along with that. 
But uh, yeah, it's but, it's pretty but cool. But a lot of your gifts are going to be combat based, so mm -hmm. you're going to be yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. to that point, when I was explaining it to my 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 the streaming group, our our pack that's uh, for our current stream, and most of them are not that familiar with Werewolf. Mm -hmm. One of them had been, the other, the rest haven't. They're really like, this is the first time experiencing Werewolf. So I was like, to be clear, you all turn into eight and a half foot, nine and a half foot tall rage monsters. So you're all going to be good at combat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Compared to most things you run into in the world of darkness, like a werewolf is a combat machine. Yeah. And we'll get in a little bit about what that kind of looks like here. But I know we kind of want to talk a little bit about that. Like I said, there's 13 tribes. And we could try covering all of them here, but you'd be doing good if you could just remember to name all 13 without looking them up. But <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, and again, they, they, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them hail very strongly from certain types of culture. So as you mentioned earlier, you have like the Fianna who are, who are Celtic. Yeah. Yeah. So they, uh, the werewolves, since the, uh, since where wolves and natural they are kind of territorial they like they, they live in certain areas and certain regions the tribes kind of sprung up from different regions of the world and eventually kind of meshed in and ran into each other and kind of eventually formed what is ten, uh known as the Gru nation and 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 on the back end uh hidden away from mortal society uh so let's see if i can name them all um good luck <laughs> I, I can do it i know i can do it uh, Bonar, Bonar uh, mm -hmm. uh, Glasswalkers, yep. Chil Children of Gaia, mm -hmm. Fianna, uh, Glasswalkers. Oh, got that twice. Oh, sorry. Glasswalker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, get get a Black mm -hmm. Furies, um, Silent Striders, Shadow Lords, uh, Octana, Wendigo. Forgetting, I know the ones you're forgetting. I, I, I all I can make sure is the all the, all the not the red talons. Yep. Um, yep. I'm remembering all the ones that no longer are default PCs. Um, <laughs> it's hard to remember what you've said already. I imagine it's, it's a long list. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You missed the silver fang. Silver fang. Oh yeah. my god, I'm so yep. ashamed. I don't, it's okay, um, it's, it's, it's not like they're the first the of them, fangs, but, but <laughs> missed the silver fangs. Yeah, since I my, my other main character was a silver fang. Ah, uh, it's all good, man. That is a tough one to remember all and of if them. You're, and if you're now you're playing twentieth anniversary edition, yes, mm -hmm. talk about editions. But if you're getting to the thirteen tribes, you got to have your stargazers in there, and mm -hmm. you got to have. I did you say black furies? Because that was the one I was thinking yeah. you were missing. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah, yeah. I said black furies. Yeah. Okay, that was the other one yeah. I was in my head. I was thinking you were missing. So can't yeah, believe you I didn't know. mention the white howlers. Ooh. They're not. They're not. <laughs> They're, they're not. I went with the thirteen that are PC current, yeah, right. the default player characters. Now, if we wanted to get the others, there's the White Howlers, the um, the Croatins, mm -hmm. and and the Bunyip, which are the three tribes that have been wiped out or supposedly mm -hmm. wiped out. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, there's there's a ton, and then if that wasn't enough, there's also other types of were creatures out there. So you know, yeah. if you could think of an animal and then just tack on the word wear at the beginning, you probably got it. You know, bears, you got cats, alligators. alligators, spiders, Jeff's favorite. Yeah, yeah, you know, Ananasis. Um, I don't know if there's a were badger. I don't remember there being a no. were badger. No, they're primarily predatorial uh, type creatures, or what mm -hmm. are assumed to be predatorial type creatures. Right. Uh, there's the, the Rokoa, which are the were sharks, there's the ratkin, which are the were rats. There are um, the nine tribes of Bastets. There mm -hmm. is the uh, the Goral. There is the Nuisha, which are the coyotes. There are uh, it's like fox or Naga, anything. Naga, which are the snakes. There's mm -hmm. the the there's the Kitsune, which are the foxes. There are uh, and then there's the bats, which I can't remember their their name for. Oh man, the werebats. I don't remember that one yeah. either. Yeah, the bats. The bats were uh, kind of a really late. They were hinted at before, but they actually came up in the thirtieth, uh, the twentieth anniversary edition. Oh, yeah, okay, and, that explains it. <laughs> and a part of that, I think, is because so many of the black spiral dancers took bat features, like they yes. looked like were bats when they weren't. So it was. I think mm -hmm. it was. It took them a long time to get around to making official were bats. Well, part of it is they end up tying them into what they. Um, 
the original bat totem got corrupted by the black spiral dancers right which are the the quote unquote tribe of evil guru um there yeah so there's a, so on top of all the good guys there's also this giant massive tribe of of evil worlds that uh, um uh yeah make offspring like bunnies um oh yeah there's and, a lot uh, going on twisted and deformed and and yeah, you start to get into a little of the cosmology when you start to mm. when you yes. start to get into werewolf, and there's a bunch of cosmology. When Jeff says that werewolf mm-hmm. is a very lore rich game, he's not joking because, like vampire, there's a lot of lore, but it's almost predominantly all human history lore. Mm-hmm. Werewolf, it's like, hey, you got all of world history. You get to talk about how the the, you know what what the Geta Fenris did during World War II, and what the Fianna did during you know the freeing of Scotland. You know this, that, the other, and then you've got like this whole other cosmology that the werewolves deal with being spiritual creatures that mm-hmm. has little or nothing to do with any of all that. It's this whole other thing, and it all boils down to the cosmology of the of the triad. So why don't you explain a little starting with like the triad and work your way there about some of the cosmology behind werewolf. Okay. So werewolf, uh, as I mentioned, has the, 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 the physical and, and spiritual aspects of it, spirit world. So, uh, from a werewolf's point of view, there are, uh, three massive cosmic forces in play that kind of form this, this, this cycle, uh, that feed into each other. There's the weaver, the wild and the worm. The, the wild is the, the forces of life, creation, chaos, which uh, spawns just raw essence. Uh, the weaver, which is the, the manifestation of order and, and structure, kind of places form to that chaos. Um, and then the worm uh, is int- the forces of entropy and breaks it down and puts it, puts it back into its raw components that then the wild takes in and feeds back to the cycle. So the mm-hmm. werewolves kind of view the three of them as a triumvirate that kind of is the natural cycle of the world. Coined to the lore, that's how it, that's how it worked originally until things got broken, <laughs> um, and then eventually uh, the the worm got a little jealous that all of this stuff um, was breaking. The weaver got jealous of the worm, and the worm got jealous of the weaver because it's like the weaver's like, I want stuff in order, and you keep breaking apart, and so the worm's like, that's my job, um, get over it, and so. The weaver goes and traps. Uh, the weaver is usually manif- um, uh, manifests or is referred to in very spider motifs, webs and st- and structure and forms, um, pattern. So it uh, ends up wrapping up the worm in its threads and basically trapping it, causing the worm to go mad. And its madness lashes out and tries to destroy everything. And and tries to just wipe out all of the universe to get itself free. So, and depending on the werewolves, some werewolves are like, it's all the worm. The worm is evil, horrible. It's destroying everything. We need to take care of it. Um, take it out. And the flip side is that some of them are like, yeah, but it's only doing that because it's the weaver's fault and the weaver needs to be taken out. We don't trust weaver tech because it's if a weaver hadn't got all over overzealous, <laughs> then we wouldn't have uh, had this mess to begin with. So, there's some, some dissension between that and which definitely comes into play when players are playing Glasswalkers, which oh, yeah. are, are city city wolves that love their technology and uh, have cool magic items that let them make all lights always green, um, <laughs> versus uh, some of the more nature-serving uh, uh, guru, especially like the Black Furies, who are very much are are self. Uh, they consider them the champions of the wild, and they're like, no, we're the champions of the wild, and. And uh, that's bad, things like that. Mm-hmm. So kind of that conflict kind of plays in there. Yeah, there's no shortage of conflict. Um, you know, yeah. it's these forces are like massive too. It's not like uh, just something you're going to bump into, you know, the first thing you go out in the night. Um, you know, they, they kind of uh, describe these as like pervasive elements, you know, the, the cornerstones of reality kind of stuff. So in the terms of like uh, the worm, uh, you see it kind of manifesting itself in like corruption of individuals, like they're well, not sin per se, but kind of adjacent to that kind of concept, you know, in some ways, or like pollution or, you know, like um, uh, exploitation, that kind of stuff. Because we get a lot of uh, the Pentex kind of corporation kind of putting its mark on the world. 
yeah, definitely over overdoing it and, and kind of uh, vice over benefit for all and giving into your vices and t- to excess and, and yeah, yeah, consumption, <laughs> I guess is a is a good one for that. Uh, and so I don't know, like in our games, we've spent a lot of time focused on primarily the worm. I would say, like we we definitely interacted with you know weaver components and things like you'd run your your spiders and stuff, kind of setting the the nature of reality at play and keeping the things static. But most of which our early games were were kind of I think themed off of our Dungeons and Dragons experiences. You know, you got to go in there and you got to fight the bad guy. The obvious bad guy is right over there. <laughs> you know. Well, the the early werewolf books really, really pin the worm down as the culprit behind it all. Mm-hmm. And you had the Black Spiral Dancers who serve the worm, and you had Pentex who mostly unknowingly serve the worm, and you had all the the Nexus crawlers who serve the worm, and it was like everything was, you know, worm foes was where it was at. You had you had abilities like sensing the worm. Well, you know, it was not a whole lot of sensing weaver going on. It was sensing the worm. Mm-hmm. There. The Weaver was an obstacle in the way a lot of times. It wasn't until like the Stargazer Tribe book came out where you read Stargazer Tribe book for the first time and they're like, hey, got a secret. It's the Weaver's fault. And you're like, what? What? No way. <laughs> and then you're like, what do the Stargazers do about it? And they're like, they take a bunch of mushrooms so they cannot see through all this stuff. You're like, all right, well, that's one way to handle it, I guess. So, you know, <laughs> but it was like the first book I remember picking up for Werewolf where it was like, hey, it ain't actually the worm's fault. So I think some of that has come about from like years and years of books and lore coming out to like, I guess kind of reset that binary dichotomy of being a champion of the wild, taking out the worm to sort of this weird kind of three way dynamic then where it wasn't all just so cut and dry. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you find you doing that for your game where you're focusing more on the weaver or the worm or balancing the two as danger or, uh, it's going to be a little bit. Of, I mean, especially since I have a glass walker in my party, so that's going to that's going to really help um, play up that a little bit more. Uh, mm-hmm. I find depending on what I'm, who I'm running, like what the the makeup of the of the pack is, uh, kind of lends itself a little bit to that story of what we're doing. Um, I, the first big um, the rite of passage stuff is definitely going to uh, focus on some worm stuff, and I'm doing some throwback stuff, and some classic werewolf stuff. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so the for the first season definitely is going to be uh, a little bit more worm heavy, I think. But uh, I generally like to play with the Weaver and the aspect of uh, which one is is really the rad, bad culprit. Because mm-hmm. one of the things that always about the lore that it was always something I wanted to, to dig into and I never had a chance to, uh, they, they, they never had a chance to, um, was there was a, a little throwaway line in one of the books referring to the um, Victorian England Okay. And this thing called this thing called the pattern war web, uh, pattern web war, um, uh, against hmm. the the encroaching of the industrial revolution and the the, the ontake of the weaver throughout. Um, Interesting. London. I'm like, where's that source book? And they never went into it. I'm like, what? No, I I, I need I, I need that source book. So there's, um, there was so many hands on those properties over time that I'm not sure all of them had read everything that had been put out prior. No, it was just one of those really cool like nuggets that was thrown in there, and just it was like an Easter egg, like hey, as a ST, if you want to grab it, and run with it, go for it. Um, so, now you're using the word ST there, and we, we've kind of bantied around the idea of storyteller, and that that's a distinction that they make in uh, World of Darkness games. Um, but it does definitely change the approach for these games. I think we talked about it with the vampire a bit, and that. Uh, you know, there was a very deliberate take for these World Darkness games to emphasize story and characters and what they are doing within the arc of a story more so than the, you know, the X's and O's of things. Um, now, do you find yourself running a different style of game as a result of that kind of focus, you know, between, like, say, a traditional Dungeons and Dragons game versus a World of Darkness game? Or do they kind of feel more or less the same to you? I, I personally don't. But I think part of that is because I ran so much World of Darkness that mm-hmm. it bleeds into my other games. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's us yeah. too. Um, uh, there's a, that's a fair statement. Yeah. Um, because uh, so and, and before that, I ran a lot of superhero stuff. I ran Champions, mm-hmm. uh, which kind of inherently leads it more so to a, a narrative kind of style, even though Champions is ultra mechanic heavy, uh, mm-hmm. because you don't. 
you don't know what a fifth level paladin you know what a fifth level paladin can do mm-hmm. but if you're writing something for 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 a superhero game you don't know if you're going to have a scientist in the in the group or if you're going to have a, a magnetic bending character or um an eight foot tall green guy who can bench press a buick you know so mm-hmm. <laughs> you kind of have to tweak the story a little bit um mm-hmm. and part of it's also i think because of the, the the GMs I exposed myself to as a younger uh, player, um, mm-hmm. I kind of pull a little bit from that, and I pull a little bit up from my, my writing experience too. Nice, yeah, yeah. Because I, I think that's what we've talked about in the past is that our experience with the World of Darkness really, I think, changed how our entire gaming group plays and runs games. Like before that, I think we were pretty much dungeon crawly X's and O's, you know, power fantasy. You know that that was the standard right and then we started dipping our toes into the world of darkness and suddenly it felt like everything changed for us you know you had some more mature themes pop up but more than that there were mature structures within the game you know lots of questions and complexities within the group and um, dynamics that weren't really present in our earlier games and we often talk about it, like we're not sure if it's due to our age at the time that we got into World of Darkness, or if there was something inherent to the way they wrote those books that brought it out in us. I don't know, did you have a, kind of a leaning on that? Like, do you, do you feel like there was one way or the other? Um, I think part of it was my first, for, for me, what really sent the bench, bench tone for me was the, my first World of Darkness game. Uh, our narrator really dug into and played with our backstories and played with our history and played with our, 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 our like what we set up. So, uh, and knowing what my experience was as a, that player, I'm like, hey, that was my one of my favorite games up to this point. Why was that my favorite game at this point? And I kind of took those lessons from that, from Phil, mm-hmm. uh, my uh, my uh, ST at the time, and kind of like, how can I improve on that? How can I? And so. Because um, I tend to end up in the, in the, the ST narrator GM DM kind of role, mm-hmm. um, so so in the early days, my uh, my early stuff at Champions, no, that was kind of really bad. But <laughs> I've gotten much better since then. I think all of our early stuff is really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think it just comes with the territory. <laughs> I, I know coming into Werewolf from D and D, like I said, we treated it very much like. We treated it very much like a dungeon in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Now we didn't werewolf because of the uh, when you have like five forms you can take. It's really hard to do X's and O grid work with World of Darkness games. They're really not designed for it at all, and that's mm-hmm. a whole other topic we could have a whole other time. But because of you weren't dealing with maps and you weren't dealing with minis, you were dealing with theater of the mind narration. Like we were just treating, you know. Uh, basically we were just using our steps as basically like dungeon entrances into the umbra right <laughs> they're going on all these missions and killing these crazy monsters as a pack and like coming back with like trophies and fetishes and all these other things you know that we were coming back with and gearing up essentially because we weren't treating it like world of darkness it wasn't until we got a vampire that we really started to understand it a little better so mm-hmm. um you know go back the other direction then later like i know that we took a lot of the character development stuff from World of Darkness and have tried to apply a lot of that back to D&D characters. So it, it's interesting then to think of how you did this with superheroes. So have you gone back to telling superhero stories and do you take a World of Darkness spin back into those with them? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the other things I do, I mean, I love my World of Darkness stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I always be a, a werewolf boy. Um, but uh, every Gen Con for the last... 10 or so um i'm a freebooter for the green running uh team which means oh, okay. i'm a demo guy. Yeah. i'm a mm-hmm. demo i'm a demo guy for green running so i usually run mutants and masterminds because mm-hmm. uh, okay. uh superheroes are my 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 bread and uh, my, my heart and soul i that was the first like my, i ran my first comics were my, my go-to and my first rpg was champions uh, that i really heavily like threw myself heart and soul into and also the first one i ran as as a um gm uh, real as a regular basis and stuff. My, uh, when I was playing D and D before that, my friends would run and I would play. So, um, so yeah. So I run uh, Mutants and Masterminds at Gen Con every year, and I also run Blue Rose um, for Green Owning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, 
uh, I definitely like focus on story and I focus on like uh, background and I try to always put those kind of moments in there. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually had a moment a couple of Gen Cons ago where I was running a um, uh, Freedom City game and I put a couple hooks into uh, one of their PCs. Uh, they were running the Freedom League, the default characters as the pregens, and one of the characters I put a hook in with. And the players took it and ran with it, like totally. I was like, so I played it up and I played it some more, and, and where they the characters were invested with with the NPC, they they were romantically involved with is is in a in a fire and needs to get rescued. So we got some question coming in here from the chat. Let's see. Do you see a vote towards certain stories in the world of darkness? I haven't seen other Lord Heavy systems personally. Oh, bias. I keep trying to say bias. Uh, Do you yeah. see a bias towards certain stories in the world of darkness? Yeah, I mean, I would think so. I mean, there, there are... Um, there's a lot of uh, story seeds inherent in the at least the first edition of World of Darkness games. Um, you know, like, they had a lot of what we call the, me- the metal of the game, you know, like the metal lore. Um, they always had these, like, comic book splats in the middle you know, between chapters that you can read, the front of the book and the werewolf book was this whole story arc. Um, lot, yeah, exactly. Like lots of uh, fleshed out stories with characters talking about what they're up to to give you a kind of a flavor uh, and a style. And of course, and then they had the novels. So like if you really wanted to get into it, they did definitely have a spin of uh, certain things that were happening in the world and things you can get involved in. But it didn't have to be your story. And it didn't have to exist in your game necessarily. Um, And I think in like subsequent editions, at least with the vampire, they stripped a lot of that out and just kind of were more of like, here's your nuts and bolts of like vampire, figure it out. (laughs) You know, what's your story? It's a local game. Go. Oh, which I kind of missed from the original. Um, But I don't know. Maybe you have a different opinion. Do you feel like that they're they're pretty much priming you for certain story arcs or did you uh, feel like it was more wide open? Yeah, well, part of it just depends on what you're running, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vampire tends to have certain kind of default, like, story beats. Mm -hmm. Um, And I say that uh, from my vampire days. Uh, So I ran a Vampire the Masquerade LARP for four years. And there's certain stories that you play any LARP long enough, that story's going to come around. Oh, 100%. Um, the evil blood disease um, that's just that's going to (laughs) happen at some point. Just 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 acknowledge it. Um, Yeah. The prince is going to get assassinated. Just accept it. At some point, the prince is going to get assassinated, and your players are going to be blamed for it. Um, mm-hmm. um, so there's there's certain. So I felt those kind of default stories happened a lot more for vampire, and partially mm-hmm. because vampire was just it's the big brother, mm-hmm. and so is the That's biggest awesome. of the. It's the biggest of the World of Darkness games. It's the most played of the World of Darkness games, and so it gets the most spotlight. So that's the one that, you know. You have enough people playing it, you start having those war stories about, this is how our GM killed off our prince. How did your GM kill off, or your ST kill off your prince? Well, and there's a big difference, I think, between tabletop and the LARP experience. So, like, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I, we did a lot of LARPing. Uh, Dustin and I also were STs for a LARP, um, you know, for quite a while. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, you're right. There are some plots that just happen. Uh, there's, there's no getting around it. But uh, with Vampire, it felt like you needed that kind of live action world to really flesh it out you needed that many active real political entities kind of banting about to have like the uh werewolf, our vampire benefits greatly from 50 mm-hmm. players yeah what it falls down to at the end of the day like yeah. and i was talking with levi our dm about this the other day because he's he's toying around with some little darkness ideas and i was talking to him about it and i said it's politics for vampire requires 50 some npcs Mm-hmm. If you're going to try to do it right. And that's hard for an ST to really juggle around. Yes, it Whereas is. Werewolf, it's all about the pack. It's about those five or six characters and a few NPCs around them. And because the politics of Werewolf, they're military. They're they're at the end of the day, they're very military in their, their mindset, right? Like, you don't have to get along with everybody in your unit anything else but then when crap hits the fan you have to trust the person to your left and your right and you have to go do a job and that's how werewolf functions vampire they never have that the coterie isn't the same as a pack like it's if you're not stabbing your friend in the back you're not doing it right (laughs) you're not allowed to stab each other in the back too hard because 
next rank up will come down on you for it. So did you do you find that's a, a philo philosophical difference in how you run those games? Yeah, definitely. When I go for, for Vampire, uh, I definitely go for Mystery, Intrigue. I kind of... Uh, uh, because I, I, I'm not a, a, an ST that regularly juggles 50 NPCs. That's so I, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I tend to go more in, into the dark and mysterious lores and the things going in the shadows that even the, the elders don't want to talk about. And uh, what horrible secrets have the Tremere uncovered now um, aspects of it to some degree, uh, which is one, probably one of the reasons I tend to run Werewolf more than Vampire. Um, but... Uh, for werewolf, I definitely uh, I joke that it's the uh, the pack is your family, and most times you don't necessarily love everyone in your family. So you may not even like everyone in your family, but right. you're stuck with them because they're family. Exactly, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Like your werewolf, it's like they're allowed to have their differences at their moots at their meetings. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to have these differences between the the wolf born and the omid born, but you're never really allowed to go to blows over it. Not fully. Like, you, you push things too far, and you literally lose rank. You're shunned in ways that, that vampires will take a loss of status and know that they got a thousand years to regain it back and then some. But, like, a mm. werewolf ain't got that kind of time. And it's, you know, there's, there's a lot more to that. They only live 60, 65, 70 years. You know, they're they got short, vibrant lives. They don't have they don't have eons to undo damage if they do it. So, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. Mm -hmm. Assuming you don't get taken out by a worm, uh, a, a worm lackey or a vampire before that. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's and there's definitely some politics that gets into play. It depends it depends on the characters involved. Um, one game I ran, the players were off doing various things, and they got back to the sept of uh, the green in New York City. And next thing they know, they had um, uh, two dozen get offenderists, uh, high ranking get offenderists there going, Yeah, you're coming with us for triumphs against Gaia. And it was this whole political maneuvering going on between uh, hit this player's character, uh, a Shadow Lord, and the get offenderists. And they, they demanded that they would come back, the whole pack come back to. Uh, accept in Bla the Black Forest in Germany for for him to stand trial, um, <laughs> and nice. uh, so a lot of political aspects kind of got slipped in, but not not so not so always in the spotlight like it can be for vampire. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's interesting. No. Um, you know, th these sorts of things do exist in the world, right? Like in the uh, the world of werewolf, that there are sept politics. You know, you have multiple packs trying to vie for rank and you know trying to shine here and there. You got different groups trying to vie for access to different important spirits and that kind of stuff, access to the cairns, all that kind of thing. Um, I think it just in tabletop, you tend not to run into it as much for the you know the logistical reasons we've talked about. You know, like being a storyteller, it's hard to make those things work. But uh, I, I was thinking back to early conventions that I went to when I was like way young. Uh, and I did a lot of werewolf LARPing. That was like actually my first LARP experience was werewolf. And when you have enough players, those politics just naturally occur. And it was really interesting oh, yeah. to see like the different tribes kind of jockeying for power, you know, whose cub is going to do what, you know, and that kind of stuff. So like it's all there. It's just a matter of what you can actually handle as a group and as a, and per particularly as an ST, I think. Yeah, the, uh, the first, the, the big LARP I ran, um, I went to run Werewolf. I really did, I, but I didn't think I'd get enough players. So, um, so I ran a Vampire in the Masquerade game uh, that was uh, pretty much a incognito Werewolf the Apocalypse LARP, because um, the first storyline dealt with uh, Pentex and um, the local Guru uh, being mucked with by uh, the local vampires being mucked with by the the Pentex and stuff like this, and mm -hmm. being used for experiments to create blood banes and all this other stuff. But uh, so I ended up with uh, some werewolf uh, PCs in the middle of a Vampire the Masquerade LARP. So that was a, it's a little interesting. Oil, meat, water. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Unless you're Shadow Lords, then occasionally it works out. Mm. So. But, uh, it so actually, yeah, it actually ended pretty well. So. Nice. They, they finished the, they finished the storyline on it. Pretty much told players early on. It's like once the storyline creates its natural conclusion. We're writing the werewolves off screen, just so you know ahead of time, and they were they were all cool with it. But 
So I think we got a loaded question coming in here, Jim. Absolutely do. The Untold <laughs> Stories Project. And I'm going to guess at this point, is that is that Rowan on there? Oh, it's got to be. Probably. 100%. It's, uh, it's no, so not even a question. There's a Jonesy question. How do you handle feel about relationships in your games? Do you prefer to plan out if it happens or just let it happen naturally? And I'm going to guess this is a loaded question, so we'll let you answer. Well, it kind of depends on... Uh... I personally, as an ST, and like, hey, if you guys want to, you know, depends on, it depends on what it is. I mean, if it's a, it's a, if it's a PC saying, hey, I want to, I want to kind of do this kind of storyline with an NPC. Obviously, I need to know because um, I need, because I need to make sure that there's an NPC that that storyline works with. Um, mm-hmm. The flip side of that is, if it's PC and PC, that's totally fine too. Um, when I mentioned my original world, the character. Uh, broke the litany. That's how he broke the litany. Uh, ah. he, he started slumming around with the bone nars, and they ended up referring to him as Bone Walker. And um, the GM at the time introduced a a very, um, a very gun ho, um, a rune bone nar who may or may not have been inspired by um, Sarah Connor, Sarah Connor character from Terminator, which mm-hmm. I was like. Uh, yeah, we're going to hang out because I'm playing a Mafia so Hitman. And so uh, I eventually end up uh, breaking the litany, and I now have a, a wayward met us out there somewhere in the world. I think with the World of Darkness, you're talking about a what I like to think of as a maybe slightly more mature game. Mm-hmm. It's going to yeah. contain mature themes. And there's a reason why they took the time in the litany to put that, like, Garou should not mate with other Garou is because they kind of intend that, like, this is part of a thing. Like, there's there's rewards in the game for if you manage to successfully mate with a not Garou. <laughs> if you if you mm-hmm. land a land yourself a human mate or a wolf mate, doesn't matter which direction you go, but you can you can go out there. And if you if you manage to create offspring, then you actually get like a reward for it. So I think they intend for relationships to happen. Just it's hard if you're playing a game because the relationships are not supposed to be between characters. So it's a little hard to ship it that way unless you're creating NPCs for werewolves specifically versus vampire, where that's very much yeah. like a regular thing, having relationships between pieces. Oh, or if you're willing to break the litany. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> now, yeah, so uh, along that lines, um, I personally found it super helpful. So. Uh, when I was first, so I got out of college and I was uh, running my first World of the Apocalypse game for a bunch of friends, including my oldest and dearest best friend from high school. Uh, I was in the closet. Okay. And none of my and none of my friends knew, uh, except for my my best friend from high school. He knew, mm-hmm. but apparently had forgotten. Um, <laughs> Fair. I <was> like, okay. <laughs> Man, I, I came, okay. I, I came out to him. He was like, "Oh, cool." Um, and then proceeded to forget because it was such a non-issue for him. Um, that's a good that's problem fair. to that's have, fair, right? I, guess. I mean, if you're going to forget, I guess that's the best way to forget. Oh, right? It's just that it was yeah. never such an issue to begin with. You forgot it was ever said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And uh, so I was running a game, and I was I was starting seeing someone, and I'm like, I really, I kind of was getting at that point where I it was it's either I come out or I break down, one or the other. Uh, so mm-hmm. I actually came out indirectly through a World of the Apocalypse game by introducing a gay NPC. Interesting. To see how the players would react, because I never act up, to, up to that point. Tough I waters, don't think yeah. I actively had an LGBTQ NPC show up. So I introduced mm-hmm. a a getter uh, a getter Fenris Theurge who was like five foot four maybe. Yeah. Uh, a little run run to the litter, uh, but he's a really skilled Theurge, and he learned how to do some martial arts to make sure he uh, wouldn't get picked on too heavily. Sort of fit in, yeah. And can kind of hold his own, but he was like really paranoid of the get because he was at a specific, mm-hmm. uh, specifically rather conservative old school get, uh, Karen, and Sept. So when the PCs got brought over for the trial, uh, he ended up becoming their ally and ended, ended up giving some tips and secrets about how to get around stuff and how who to challenge for com- uh, dual combat and to get out of the trial itself and things like that mm-hmm. under the one condition that they take him with them. And at this oh, point, okay. they 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 realized that because uh, one of the uh, the characters was trying to flirt with him, and he wasn't reacting to her. And that they they like, wait a minute, hey, and they they nudged one of the other characters and said, why don't you try flirting with him? And uh, 
like what he's like i think he's i think the character's gay and so they end up hitting and it was it ended up being a, a good storyline the players really liked the npc they they made sure he got out of there and got to the sept of the green in new york city and uh and so for me that was like oh cool my, my players are cool with this and so it gave that's me, awesome <laughs> it felt like it gave me permission to then come out to them oh absolutely so, how long ago was this? Like, uh, like what era are we talking about? Uh, this was uh, the 90s. Yeah, so this was kind of party. in that t- tough times then, for sure. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, before "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" was repealed, and mm. yeah, you know, all that stuff. So, boy, that's tough. Yeah, well, that's that's a really wonderful thing to discover. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting that you went with Get a Fenris uh, for that too, because. Uh, for, for those in the chat, Geta Fenris are like the Nordic, like, big Viking battle badass, you know, like, oh, I'm bro man, you know, like, kind of guys. So, like, that that's a really uh, high-octane situation to be in at that point. And, you know, they, they were also heavily tied with with a lot of, uh, a lot of Germany through World mm-hmm. War II to and some of the stuff that went down too so when you when you talk about get a fitness where you get a lot of that so that is an interesting choice for you to use that as a vehicle then because that in a way if your players know enough about the lore like it really puts them not near that mindset at all so then to come around to that conclusion on their own is a is an interesting way of doing that yeah uh it looks like in chat joker is talking about an experience they had with a player uh yeah and we were talking a little bit at this question or this statement here is going to kind of dovetail back in but uh we were talking a little bit about some edgy components to the world of darkness games and one of those is that the the get a fenris kind of has a tendency to lean a little into white supremacy worlds sometimes if it's not corralled in very carefully and it sounds like this person that you were gaming with um came out as a neo-nazi after showing a lot of love for get a fenris uh that sucks <laughs> that is terrible yeah um and, yeah, so, I mean, all the, the world of darkness, the very last word of, of that is darkness. And yeah. every tribe, and I'm not picking on the get offenders here, every tribe has kind of baked into them a little bit of that. Just like every every clan of vampire has a little bit of that darkness baked into them. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter which wraith is just darkness everywhere. Like, so you, this is all baked into what this world is. And a part of the world of darkness, in my opinion, mm-hmm. is getting an opportunity for better or for worse, to somewhat kind of explore some of these things in, like I said, a mature game environment where you can tackle these things in some ways and have revelations about some of these things. And that's, a, in my opinion, it's a core part of what World of Darkness is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there's more than a there's more than a fair share of Geta Fenris who hate that shit and Absolutely. will hunt down those other guru and destroy them on site. Right. So, yeah. yeah. The more it's of that, the better. We're a generation ago at this point. So yeah. it's like they're literally the get offenders with the OK boomers. You know, like talking to them like they're like, that's not how things are now. You know, Grandpa. Let's see. Uh, looks like Rage Rune is talking about they also had a, uh, a gay Fenrir Thurge in their game. And nobody messes with them because of strength with this will and with spirits. Uh, let's see. Made a physical cage for a mad ancestor and bound a war avatar of Fenris. To keep her from killing his companions who were fighting it. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Like this is the sort of stuff that comes up in games. <laughs> Don't mind me. I just made a cage to cage a rampaging war avatar of Fenris and uh, make sure it didn't kill everybody. Yeah, just a regular Monday around here. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Leviathan hit it. Like it's it's almost like some of the old where White Wolf didn't have a whole lot of women writers. <laughs> and I think maybe that is safe to say about mm-hmm. most. TTRPGs in general that were coming out of that time period, there was not a lot of women voices out there. I mean, it was fantastic that they were like, hey, let's try to give women like mm-hmm. a tribe of their own. Like, I can respect that idea. Like, hey, we're going to give them something too. But like, then when you look at what was written about them and the way that they 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 acted, it was totally not from from a woman's perspective at all. Yeah, they uh they got a lot better with some of the, the lighter stuff and trying to do the revised editions and the 20th anniversary edition to kind of it's good lose a lot of that, that garbage baggage like that mm-hmm. and get it That's to be good. a little yeah I feel like back in the 90s there was a there was a lot of edge lording going on it was just you know putting content out to be shocking for the sake of shock and I, I don't think there was a, enough really introspection of what they were writing 
at times. You know, I was like, oh, if you're if you're really mature, you'll get it. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, we don't need that. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, it's safe to say the 90s was the decade of the bad boy anti-hero sitting in the back of the classroom type kid, right? Like, <laughs> that, those were who all your most popular quote-unquote characters were at the time, right? You get your, your Cloud Strifes and your Wolverines and your Batmans. Like, those were the characters that really took on during that time. And and a character who wasn't that way, they, they had to try to put them into that box in some way, shape, or form. So, yeah, I think there was a definite push towards trying to make things as edgy as they can make them. Yeah, yeah Black and, Dog Game Factory. Some- Something I always uh, uh, I push back on is I, you know, they made Sabat player characters. And I'm like, nope, not my game. They made Fomori player characters. I'm like, nope, not my game. They're mm-hmm. meant to be bad guys. They're meant to be the things you fight against. So, yeah, it, it's it's the World of Darkness threw a lot of challenges at a, a gaming group and said, hey, f- just figure it out. Navigate this without stepping on the thousand landmines that are in front of you. Um, <laughs> good luck <laughs> uh, but if you got through it as a gaming group and you learned the lessons you were intended to learn along the way maybe not intended to learn but that you should learn uh, I think you came out of it a lot better as a group you know you, if you can navigate the space well let's see uh, question from Joker hey Jonesy can I play with a black spiral dancer who worships the defiler worm <laughs> No. Actually, I had that when I was a ST for a Vampire Alert. I had a, I had a 3 by 5 index card that had no written real big on one side of it and no written real big on the other side. I'm like, oh, you don't like that answer? Here, check this one. Um, <laughs> no, you can't play a, 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 a sixth generation Daughter of Cacophony. No, no, not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. That, man, we needed one of those cards. We, we just had the fake stamp at, uh, at the LARP. So oh, like, yeah. Only the STs knew what it meant, but there was like a one particular stamp you'd put on the cards that people got because you get cards out for any of the items and shit. And it was universally known across like states that if you saw that, you were to rip up this card. <laughs> and so like when yeah. they go into a new new game to check in, like, oh yeah, I've got this item. <laughs> was that one world by night or the Camarilla? Uh, we we did it uh, both actually. Um, one world by night. It yeah. Then we, we did independent night. after that, but yeah. Yeah, my my game was a one world by night game. <laughs> I banned an entire city from my game. Oh yeah, <laughs> you had to do that from time to time. That if if a card came stamped from that city, you were just like, yeah, that doesn't exist here. So, hey, it wouldn't happen to be Kenosha, was it? <laughs> no, but I heard of them. I knew about that. I knew about that. <laughs> um, I was running the Columbus, Ohio chapter at the time. Oh yeah, I did some playing over there. I wonder if we ran into each other back in the day. Yep, yeah. there's Malice. He's like, sounds like a Kenosha thing. Yeah, a Kino thing. He knows. Yep. Kenosha. Um, yeah, Malice an old yeah, school the, Yeah, the city I banned was Dayton. When I found out the Prince had two Black Spiral Dancer uh, Thrall hench, henchmen, and oh I'm boy. like, nope, no, 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 never would happen. Nope, nope, nope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Conclave, yep. Yeah, Columbus had some good convention LARPs, too. That's, that's where I kind of cut my teeth. Uh, ah, I wonder... Was it back in the 90s? It was back in the 90s. I was a wee little lad in the 90s, but yeah. There's a very good chance that was our LARP. It could have uh, been. <laughs> me and uh, Aaron, who plays Kennedy on our uh, um, on our stream, uh, mm-hmm. we were part of a group that, that, that ran the regular game, and then we ran the big convention uh, uh, three big convention LARPs at Columbus huh. at Origins. Um, well, I went to Origins all the time, so it, it very well could have been. <laughs> Yeah, our, our first big one was uh, revolved all around the Giovanni and a race storm outside the convention center. Yep. Some I think the, I remember that one. Well, <laughs> mentioning some of the people from that whole Black Spiral Dancer mess are in mine and his MMO guild. <laughs> we, we, we might know some of those people. <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, so we got some questions from Joker about... Uh, so Werewolf is kind of famously infamous for its antagonist, such as... I don't Zizek. even know how to pronounce that. Zizek? Zizek, yes. Who is a black spiral dance is like a female dominatrix. Oh, Star- right, right. I remember that character now. Zizek. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on Samuel Height? I don't even remember who that is. I, I, I have very strong opinions about that specific NPC. Um, indirectly, maybe the cause of one of my uh, PC's demise. Um, 
<laughs> yes. Um, so the the big uh, campaign book I referred to earlier was a, a book called uh, Chaos Factor, which featured Sam. A- okay. And uh, you know, my character in one of the art pages is, is a pack of Guru, and there's a like multi armed uh, woman crawling down from the top, some behind them, and these she's grabbed one of the players, and she, one of the characters is yanking them up. Uh, he's wearing a black leather jacket. That's my uh, glass walker. <laughs> Was my glass walker. Yeah. Oh man, that's awesome. So, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I remember that picture. Which book did you see that was in? Chaos Factor. Hmm. That's amazing. Like I said, it's it's freaking cool. <laughs> Werewolf is the like I said again. Werewolf is the one World of Darkness game where, and I don't know why this is true. But so much of the identity of Werewolf is based on those NPCs, mm-hmm. both the good and the bad ones. Zizak, Samuel Height, uh, Tsenik, like you have all of these these characters that in comic book style fashion, like, you know who they all are. And they all play this predominant role in this this society that you just don't see in the same. In my opinion, you don't see the same with the other games. Like, it's hard to, like, I, you know, pull all those names out, like. It, it's it is interesting that it's that those names are so synonymous with this game when they live well, in the same world. Yeah, part of it is those those characters also because they they were werewolves or, or related to the werewolf line means they weren't city bound. Mm-hmm. Like most of the, the kindred of of you so you go to the the uh, L.A. by Night book and most of those characters are L.A. bound. They're not going to leave their their territory. It's not safe for them to leave the territory. Um, whereas the NPCs from Werewolf can pop over from here or there, and several of them showed up in non-Werewolf books. Mm-hmm. True. Yes. Um, because, so that gave them the advantage because you know they didn't have to worry about them. Uh, like, oh, I don't. My this NPC won't burst into flames in sunlight, so we can move them. Um, this NPC isn't tied to their power structure, structure in a specific city, so mm-hmm. they can move. Which is interesting when you think of how territory. Yeah, how territoriality exists in uh in these games, you know, you'd think with a werewolf culture, you know, at this whole, you know, this is my ground, you know, stay out kind of thing. But it's more the the vampires that end up that way. Well, I think with the vampire, like you think of like the Sabato the Hammer, <laughs> and it's they're they're global organizations. Mm-hmm. They're kind of like more like um. If you want to think of it in the business world, kind of like an LLC where it's like, yeah, your Burger King is technically a franchise, but like corporate don't care. It's all about what the local manager's doing. And that's how Vampire is like whatever's going on in that city is going on in that city. And the other mm-hmm. cities could care less because it's that person's problem to run that city. He's got a prince, his domain, his problem, not my problem. Whereas Werewolf is kind of like, hey. What goes on over there in the West Coast affects us on the East Coast, and we're just a moon bridge away from being there, guys. So hop into the moon bridge. We'll be there in a minute, and we're gonna take care of some stuff over on that side of the on that side of the continent. You know, so like, I think there is a certain uh, mobility, like you said, to, to werewolf that does lend to that. Mm-hmm. That m- the world is still more reachable. Now, and the, and the world focus tends to be a little bit more external um, to some mm-hmm. degree. Uh, and I take that from, from at least from my point of view. Uh, how I kind of view it is, in my opinion, Werewolf is actually the mo- one of the most, if not the most, darkest of the World of Darkness games. The, the, at this point, the werewolves have lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the worm is going to destroy the earth. The werewolves have lost. You're dying out. You're just going down. Like you're just going down swinging. But you are gonna like you're gonna lose. You you have already lost. Everyone knows you've already lost. Um, but the worlds are like, well, fine. We're we're losing. We're dying. That's fine. We're taking as many of them with us. Mm-hmm. Um, jo- jo- Joker, he he uh, <laughs> he hits my sentiments exactly. I always put werewolf second behind a raid because it's hard to get darker raid, than a raid. Yeah. And then you <laughs> go where you there's not like even death is not the end for you now. Like you're you mm-hmm. got to suffer even beyond death. So yeah, I've always put wraith at the top when it comes to comes to that and then werewolf and probably changeling right behind it sometimes because they're just in about the same situation the werewolves are in they're like yeah uh, home's lost we're done <laughs> the the difference is there's a this is just enough hope for the werewolves to have it and have it dash from them the race yep. never have any hope they know they're screwed from day one that mm-hmm. is true yeah. and it's the, the the loss of hope i think if, if the st does it right the loss of hope mm-hmm. can drive it home to be fair though i haven't played enough wraith and i'm trying to fix that 
Uh, uh, yeah. Wraith showed up in a lot of my game tangentially. Because mm-hmm. you had Silent Striders, so I could play with some ghost stuff, as Rowan is finding out. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, uh, in Vampire, we had a Giovanni faction running around our city for a while, so mm-hmm. I got to play with Wraith stuff. And I ran some Changeling uh, LARP stuff, and we had Slua, and I got to play with some Wraith stuff. And it was also set in... Um, uh, San Diego, uh, near Old Town. So I was playing with the whole concept of the old city actually being a haunt and having the the bleed it bleed into the dreaming and stuff like that. So, um, gotcha. Now we got a question from Mary Laser. She said she watched the show called The Order, and there's werewolves, and they're trying to stop the end of the world because of magic users. But the werewolves can also use magic. She wants to know if werewolves can use magic in, t- in this TTRPG. And the answer is sort of, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. The the worlds in Werewolf the Apocalypse can learn gifts that are taught to them by the various spirits. If they're uh, so, they can have some supernatural abilities. I've actually watched the Order, um, and I jokingly refer to it as my first Werewolf the Apocalypse game, um, uh, because it has some <laughs> elements that kind of reminiscent. It's it's um, so it's kind of a good intro, I think, in in its own weird kind of like. Slight tangent, alternate Earth kind of way. So, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting take because um, most of the things that you're getting have to do with your relationships to supernatural entities and trying to, you know, like curry favor so that you can learn some aspect of what they are. You know, it's like you might go to a fox spirit to learn how to be more stealthy and, and tricksy, you know, or you might go to, I don't know, like a a lion for braveness or something like that, you know? Uh, And so like, that was a big part of what made werewolf tick, you know, was kind of like what your relationships were with the, the local supernatural fauna and flora. Um, So I don't know, to me, like the Umbra was always like one of the most interesting things about the game, but it was just like one piece kind of layered into that cake, you know? So like, uh, what do you think are like the main themes that are like integral to telling a werewolf story as opposed to like a vampire story um so a little bit depends on your makeup because uh, there's a lot of stories you can tell with werewolf so it'll probably be a little bit depends on the makeup of your pack um you know uh, you could do stories like um if you're having glass workers, especially if you have glass workers, you know uh what is the price for technology you know Mm-hmm. And reflecting the progress versus the, the environmental destruction that's caused to make that newest smartphone or or whatever, um, and and uh, and cycles. Cycles is the one I play with a lot. Yeah, and things kind of mm-hmm. things repeat. History is doomed to repeat itself um, to the point where I like to play with this a specific. It's so a world and um, actually in world of darkness. There's a background. You have backgrounds you can add, which gives you extra contacts or allies or think little things that don't really fit in stats per se. Like mm-hmm. I'm really good at this skill. Well, backgrounds are kind of like a catch-all for some of like the more esoteric. Like I have friends in high places, or um, I've got really. I start with a really cool um, in, in spirit imbued item. Uh, one of them is ancestors, mm-hmm. and yeah. I love playing with ancestors. So in the werewolf mythology, they're part of that the wave of wild worm. They're part of that natural cycle of things. So werewolves are part of that cycle. So they, when they die, there's a good chance they reincarnate. Theoretically, if there's enough werewolves born, that would be able to. to yeah. Good luck. So they have they can they can they, yeah. Good luck with that. So they yeah. could have lived past lives and and be born again, and so. Uh, I, uh, so I like to play with that to the point where. My, my last big campaign I ran for, for a couple of years, uh, the characters all had character folders that had like five different character sheets in it. Uh, one of them had their standard character sheet, but then they also had a Werewolf the uh, Wild West character sheet huh. and a Dark Ages character sheet. Oh, and Nice. And, and they had a couple other uh, sheets. And so I, I would run flashbacks or scenes uh, completely with separate characters that were their ancestors. And so I'd have story elements from those past events 
cycle up to the modern day and play up on those elements again. So I love to play with that, that history repeats itself. We're doomed to our own failures again. Um, the, one of the big, the biggest time I got for the pull off was uh, I was running one big camp, the first big campaign where I came out in. Um, one of the, the NPC, one of the players was playing a child of Gaia, or at least she thought she's a child of Gaia. Um, and early on, I decided I was going to drop it in a, a vampire that mask a ventru from Vampire the Masquerade as an NPC. Okay. And so for the first five or six games, they only communicated him via uh, messages and email. Mm -hmm. uh, and and his his uh, all they had was a call sign for him, which was King of Scepters, um, because the ventru clan emblem is a Gotta scepter. Be. Right, and uh, and whenever and so eventually they they got to the point where they're talking to him on the phone and stuff, and they got to meet him. And uh, whenever I played him, I had a specific little necklace I'd wear, kind of give us a clue that I was in character as that specific NPC. It's a um, trick, yeah. Because it was one of those, we were, as one of those, we as a group all went out one day in Columbus, Ohio, and we're doing the, the, they used to have all a gallery hop through all the little galleries there. And as we were doing it, we came across this really cool little necklace. I was like, ah, oh, it's really cool. It was a little square pendant with some uh, cool uh, edging to it, but mm -hmm. there was an onk pattern on it. But instead of being on it, it was cut out of it. So it was like a, a, a inverse. Oh, like a negative? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, that's really cool. And it was, it was more iconic and it looked a little different. So I'm like, Cool. Mm -hmm. I grabbed it because it was only a couple bucks, and I and I ward wore that whenever I played him as an NPC. And they eventually met him in person, and got talking to him, they got to know him, and he finally confesses to one of the characters, "Well, I know who you are. I know what you are. I've known what you are since Constantinople. <laughs> um, every time you die, I find you again. I search the world over to find you again. Uh, you're the one thing that keeps me going." And they find out he's like a like sixth generation venture and he's got like eight humanity points and he's pretty much like all wow. even kill and stuff. Uh, he had done through all these rituals and stuff and, and killed more than a few Tremere in his early days to find out like secrets of Glaconda and, and kind of like keep everything in check. And uh, he does all for this, this, this woman he loved who happened to be a world who kept reincarnating. And huh. uh, as over the course of the campaign, they, they, they got close and they became a, a kind of a pseudo item. And they're like, the players were all conflicted, like where he's a vampire, but he's, he's a nice guy and he's helping us. And, and uh, it was really cool. Lots of cool uh, character bits and drama. And at the end of the campaign, Pendex had gotten a hold of him. Oh, rough. Pendex, Pendex injects him with a bunch of Bane blood, Bane infused blood. And makes him go frenzy, and and so for like the next six or seven games, he's completely mad and just in total berserk mode nonstop. And they, he fights. They keep him on a leash and a chain, and they end up letting him loose at the players a couple of times. And the players don't want to hurt him because they know he's a good guy, but he's also a ultra powerful vampire that's trying to rip the throat out. Uh, and the the campaign near the end, the, the near the build up to the final big conf conflict, where it's, which against a certain black spiral dancer that has been named in the stream. Um, so yes, I do play with NPCs a lot. Um, they, uh, they, they meet and uh, they arrange for them to meet. He's got a new little uh, ghoul character that helps kind of, because he's gotten away from Pedex and stuff. And uh, they have this whole thing. They have this big, this big moment where I pull the player aside and we're, we're talking and we're talking in character and like, you know, you know, I found you before. I'll find you again. You were the love of my life, I, like, but I'm not safe to be around. I need to go and, and try to find myself again and, and, and shackle the beast once more. And he's doing this whole big thing in this speech, and she knows it's the end. And she starts crying, and I start crying. And the last thing I do is I, I take off the necklace and I hand it to her. Oh, and 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 then that goes. It goes from a little bit of wa uh, waterworks to full on waterworks, and. Um, and, and that was kind of the evening end it. And the following game, she puts on the necklace. And I'm like, you realize it's silver. It's going to cause you to take ag when you shift. She's like, I don't care. Um, and they go in the big fight. And they, it was the final big showdown. They're all like rank four guru at this point. They've built their own Karen. They, um, it was a long campaign. <laughs> Apparently. And they, <laughs> and they go to this huge epic combat. And I'm like, you know, she's like, I shift to Kronos. I'm like, you take an ag. You're going to take an ag at every point of this round. She's like, I don't care. And uh, at that point, I'm like, as much oomph as she's putting into this, uh, I basically have a spirit drawn to it and turn it into a fetish. I'm like, this point, it has to become a fetish because I to. mean, yeah. it has to. Um, and so, fetishes are magic items with spirits bound in them. For those who don't know, um, in World. And so, 
sorry. Anyway, uh, it's a dire track, So pretty I freaking apologize. awesome is what that is. I mean, it's it's rare that you can pull off moments like that where there's that much kind of just raw emotion kind of channeled into a scene. You really have to have people ready to go, you know, to run a game like that. Uh, yeah, and Joker, yeah, yeah, nothing related to the other use of that word. Uh, you know, it's just more of an item that is infused with uh, Im importance, value. I guess it's technically the same word at that point, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, it has some connotation which is very important to you. Uh, or in this case, the spirit is attuned to it. Um, but man, that's a really awesome. Like, you know, if, if you really kind of reflect back on your gaming histories as players, everyone in the chat here as well, uh, there's probably a handful of times where you've had a scene that got that far, you know, like that really impacted a player or a group of players. And those are the moments you, you really got to bank. You know, those are the times you, you sit around the table to generate those moments. So that's that's freaking cool. And I would say almost all of mine are LARP. A, a lot of them, yeah. Uh, the bulk of them are LARP related, I think, for me. Mm -hmm. It's... It's a special thing. It takes a special environment for that to work. Um, Joker, he, we, he kind of yeah. talked about that earlier on in the show. Um, whether you, whether you, who do you consider the true enemy to be? Whether it's uh, the worm, the weaver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in most of my games, the true enemy of the world of the werewolves are the werewolves themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, because they're too busy. Uh, letting themselves get splintered and fragmented and not taking on what they need to take on, which is why they're dying out. Exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a big theme um, of the game. I know Malif asked earlier if you have a favorite tribe, and I think I was through, the that, yeah. this, uh, through the course of this discussion, I think I know your answer, but fire away. I really don't, per se. There's there's a few tribes I, I lean toward more than others, um, but picking a favorite's really difficult for me. Um... Yeah, I, I, I would think Silver Fang maybe. Silver really? Fang. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, the one time you forgot the name when you were. Yeah, looking. yeah. <laughs> this is why I was speaking my talk. Man, <laughs> I, I honestly thought you were going to say Glasswalker. I did too. Um, I, I, I thought you were going to say Glasswalker. Yeah, I, I'm fond of the Glasswalkers. I really am, and they're probably up the top top three. Um, mm -hmm. I also love the Shadows. I'm not, but I'm also a ST most of the time. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Uh, the Shuttlers and, and uh, Silver Fangs give me uh, there's so much inborn drama with them. Yeah, power dynamics. Yeah, they they're, they are just the most the devia uh, the biggest divas in the whole Guru Nation. So they just give me the most to play with. Yeah. As far as trouble, um, if you and I, yeah. Go ahead. And I, was, and I, I may have let an ST at one point. Uh, let me use some really, really broken merits with a, with a silver fang. So I'm a little biased to that character. He was completely OP, but I loved him anyway. Yeah, well, being OP helps. <laughs> if you ever want to make a werewolf game feel like a vampire, just add mm -hmm. more silver fangs and shadow lords. Yes, yes. They do a real good job <laughs> of it. Quickly starts to look more vampirish the more than you got hanging around. So if it's you get that um, politics in there, that that's what happens. My, my husband refers to him as Tremere with fur. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, for those of you in the chat who don't know the tribes, um, Silver Fangs are kind of like the, uh, they're, they're established to be the lords of the werewolf world, even if they maybe aren't necessarily, but they kind of fit that role, you know, like, and then the Silver, or not Silver Fang, the Shadow Lords are kind of the, like, scar of the, uh, the Lion King world, you know, it's like, they should the be in power. That is a that is a damn good analogy, Jeff. I had never thought of it before, but Silver Fangs are Mufasa and the Shadow Lords are Scar, and that yep. is about as good as analogy as you'll find anywhere else if you want to know what those two tribes <laughs> are about. Uh, Malice wants to know, Jonesy, did you ever do Castle LARP? I have not. No. Okay. Oh. Sorry. See. Yeah, we're, we're we're running into some old LARPers in the in the chat here. Malice is a, a big time LARPer back in the day. Uh, he did a lot of traveling too, so I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of us have bumped into each other at some point and just not realized it. <laughs> yeah, I did a, I did a, a fair amount in Columbus because I ran the. There was a weekly vampire. It was a weekly vampire the masquerade LARP I ran. I started actually started, um, by going, dragging my friends, kicking and screaming into playing. I'm like, please, 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 and they all they all agreed, assuming it wouldn't happen. 
<laughs> and four years later, when I moved out of Columbus, it was still going strong. Um, so nice, well done. Um, that's always fantastic when that happens. Yeah, when it lasts after you've gone, that's a good sign. So, not yeah. always easy to pull off. Because you know, like it, we we talked about this before too. It seems like the um, the environment shifted radically. You know, like it seemed like World of Darkness games and LARPs were thriving at a certain point, and then all of a sudden it was just like, <laughs> just gone. You know, and like for us, it kind of rose and fell with the goth community. Like whenever the uh, the goth scene dried up, that was like the end of the vampire LARP. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, got a great question coming in here for Joker. Now, we talked a little bit about Werewolf the Apocalypse. And it has the, the subtitle of The mm. Apocalypse. And there did eventually hit a point with the old school editions of Werewolf and Vampire where they finally got around to deciding the apocalypse is going to happen. And one of the cool things they did, and I have to preface this for Joker's question so that the rest of chat who maybe aren't World of Darkness lore fanatics will understand this. When they decided to create an end to their like 20 some years or whatever of lore, it seemed like they had at the time, they basically said, okay, here's a book and here's like five different ways you can end it. Now, Joker wants to know what your favorite ending was for that apocalypse book. I'm going to disappoint all of chat. Uh, I don't have a favorite. Um, I had moved and I wasn't actively running any World of Darkness games or actually any tabletop RPGs at all uh, at that point when the apocalypse finally happened. Um, gotcha. So I never got to run it. Uh, I have it. I own it. Um, and I, I, I hinted at it and bits of it. I ended up combining different elements from a couple of different of the endings and were hinting at it in a campaign I was running. But, but then again, I moved a third time, and that campaign never <laughs> finished. So, Yeah, I, I, I concur with Joker and Malice here. Um, I didn't do the Apocalypse one, so I have no idea what their endings were. But when the Gehenna book came out, which is the book for Vampire's ending, I was super, super invested in the meta. I had read all the novels. I had read all the books that had came out for the game system. I was way into it. I was super excited to see what was finally the answer of how it all shakes down. And then you got a choose your own adventure book with some like half fleshed out endings. And I went, this is, if I wanted to choose my own ending to this, I would have written it. I just threw yeah. the thing away like instantly. It just, I it, hated it that thing so, so much. It was so <laughs> rough because the books leading up to them were so damn so good. good. They were so good. Now I will, I will say this. As much as I didn't care for the book Apocalypse itself, and as much as I didn't care for Gehenna itself, I loved the associated novels. Yep. That actual werewolf, the last novel was fantastic. And I didn't think I'd ever like a vampire book more than a werewolf one, but the final one for vampire with Beckett, the gang girl running around with a particular NPC for an entire mm -hmm. book. You don't realize it's him till the end was fantastic and very, very well thought out and done. So yeah, they, they had really good books. Um, they did. If you haven't, if you get the chance to go back and find some of these old books, Definitely do yourself a favor, dig them up and give them a read. They're, they're really, really fun. And uh, The World of Darkness is just a very entertaining story. Like, they, they yeah. do a really good job of just fleshing it out for us. Let's see. Yeah, the top notch quality. Yeah. I will say this uh, of the endings, the Inside the Church Gehenna one was my favorite. Just because I feel like with the, with the way the World of Darkness game works for a tabletop setting, it's all about your characters anyway, your, your, mm. your PCs that you're working with, whether you're a PC or the ST, it's all about them and their story. And in my opinion, those get vampire works best in that setting where you're trapped and you can't get out. And that's just the vampire city to begin with. You already can't leave your city. It's your domain. You got to deal with it. And to be even trapped further inside of a single building, like that's where things are going to boil over. And it's almost like, in my head, the same way that like the hateful eight plays out, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. things boil exactly up. Like that. Eventually, someone takes someone out, and then everyone still can't leave, and they just got to sit there and deal with the fact that that just happened in the room they're sitting in. Like that's the kind of tension for vampire that I want. So that one always appealed to me the most. But for werewolf, it's the complete opposite. You got to go for the biggest, baddest ass war scene you can get. So mm -hmm. they were that. In my opinion, that right there is the difference between those two games. It was just. Werewolf had to go balls out as best you could, and Vampire was keep it small and intimate. 
So yeah, I suppose yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Uh, all the stuff that they added during the the end, the time of judgment, in the end, the apocalypse books and stuff. The only one I I really remember having a really strong opinion about was uh, Changeling, actually. Um, Surprisingly, because I wasn't that big of a Changeling fan, but yeah, I never paid attention uh, so much. In um, the time of Judgment, they end up dropping in a brand new house, and I'm like, "No, why add? What, what are you? <laughs> what, what are you? What are you doing?" Oh, no. So, for those who don't know, uh, Changeling is that you play the various pixies and 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 boggins and redcaps and and she and and hidden throughout the world, and the nobles are broken into thirteen houses. Six of the Sealy, six of the Unsealy, and one house that's that's split 50-50 Sealy Unsealy, kind of the balancing point, the tipping point. Thirteen being such an iconic number in, well, folklore and mythology and especially fey mythology, mm-hmm. it was perfect. And they ended up I added a fourteen thousand. I'm like going, you guys, what you did realize what you did right here? You broke up the the symmetry and no stop. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the thirteen always happens in World of Darkness. Like if all the games had it. Symmetry, the end is the time to do it. <laughs> right? like, yeah, but why? We, why bring in a new character? Balance up till the end. It's time to upset everything. Like that's what they did with the other games too. In a way, though, they upset everything. So at yeah, that point, I, I guess it's yeah. That's true, but like when you're doing an ending to something, all the players should already be on the stage, right? Like the oh, and by the way, there's a new person. Would you like to know about their story? Well, too bad. It's the last episode. Uh, what What is the point of that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah so. there is some truth to that. Like, yeah, it, it, it's changeling for me was always an interesting kind of kind of an oddball in the mm. world of darkness. Like it was for me always one of the hardest of the games to incorporate into a world of darkness game that wasn't just solely that game itself. Like you can play changeling on its own. You're fine. But when you start trying to have Changeling interact with anything else, like it gets kind of real wonky real quick. Like Mage is easy to do, Vampire is easy to do, Werewolf, in my opinion, is easy to do. Wraith and, and Changeling were the hardest ones for me to do that with. Um, and so it, it, it's, yeah, I, I mean, when you're talking about a group that's trying to get to a place, like when they're trying to connect with that that childlike home of, of Arcadia and this at the other and how it's lost. Like, I guess if you kind of get there and then you find there's like this other house that's been there the whole time or something like, it's not that out of line, but. Well, I mean, the, the core components of changing, like Joker's saying is, is about like holding on to the creative spark and trying to, to continue to find that like essence of, you know, being a child essentially in a world where you're being forced to be, you know, adult and responsible and that kind of stuff. So, like, it, it's a different play. You know, it's it's fighting against aging, essentially. Uh, if you, like, kind of strip it down to its, like, basic components. You know, whereas, like, the other games are... They have a different feel about them. You know, like, Werewolf is about raging against the dying light. You know, like, ah, oh, this is the end. You know, and Vampire is about, like, oh, yeah, well, we're basically slipping into oblivion by our own misdeeds and it's just inevitable at this point that somewhere along the lines i will become a monster you know wraith is i'm slowly being sucked into a vortex of unmaking great yeah let's let's just forget who i am my identity's gone awesome Uh, mage is all about hubris and you know losing yourself in power you know so like they all have like their different takes so like right kind of pushing those themes together it gets a little different i guess yeah, and, and, and Joker's nailed it. The, I mean, Werewolf, the cosmology overlaps everything. And hmm. we talk about the cosmology and how it hits to the level of abstract forces that a lot hmm. of the other systems in World of Darkness don't touch. And so at the end of the day, it's easy to take something like vampires and wrap them in as like minions of the worm or the weaver in some situations. Like, But it's harder to take Werewolf and fit it into like changeling cosmology because changeling ends up being a part of werewolf cosmology it ends up going the other direction so like it's hard to do but it's it's still there but yeah i'm I'm with you on that joker now he did ask another fun question here Mm -hmm. this maybe the last one we have time for tonight for jonesy he wants to know how you felt about werewolf the forsaken so uh i i do own werewolf the forsaken i own requiem i own yeah um 
I thought it was a superior mechanically. It's a superior game. Yep. Hands down, I, I think the mechanics for 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 Forsaken and the whole Chronicles of Darkness, uh, at least the first edition, uh, yeah. were better. I'm like, this is great. awesome. Um, the lore seemed to be less dense and more slated for uh, easy entry. At least that was the intent, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's what I got from it from the uh, when I looked back at it with my uh, my. Uh, now that I I do this as a freelancer sometimes uh, eyes I'm like oh I see what they're going for um, mm-hmm. but as a player it didn't grab me it didn't grab me I, I didn't I, when I read it I didn't immediately like I know what I want to play I want to play this character right. or that character I, I didn't immediately have that aha moment and as such it never grabbed me and I'm like mm, it's not for me and I set it back on my shelf I own it I still own it and sitting on my shelf but. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. Like, we ended up playing mostly Requiem for Vampire, which is the kind of analogous num- uh, edition for uh, Vampire. Um, and, I, and I agree. Like, all those new ones, vastly superior systems. Like, the actual mechanics of the game work better yeah. than they ever did before. The old ones are broken and just a total disaster of balancing. Uh, but like you said, like, they specifically went into it stripping down all of the, the soul of what those games were like you know all the lore and everything was really toned down and so to me it always felt like an open world game you know it was like you can do anything you want there's kind of a world out there that's sort of got some characters and there's a couple things we'll sort of say exist out there maybe kind of but we won't tell anything about it so go, go figure it out whereas yeah, the old stuff so- it was like a world really built for you to explore yeah, and so, like I said, it didn't grab me. Now, some of the later um, forays back into that, those kind of those elements uh, did. Like, I love Changeling the Lost. Mm. I, I got Changeling the Lost. Went, this is this is amazing because it's apples and oranges that I can't impart. And I know it's for good or for bad. I can't subconsciously compare it against Dreaming because it's so different. So I haven't um, looked at that one at all. I have no idea what it's like. It, it's one of the oh. books I did not get, actually, because I didn't mm. really care for Changeling that much the first time. So when they read them, I was like, I care less even more. <laughs> um, and uh, I know a lot of players who didn't like old Changeling who like the new version. So I, well, maybe I'll take it for it well. Um, and uh, I know lots of Changeling the Dreaming fans who don't like the new version because it is... It is darker. It is significantly darker. It definitely feels like it belongs in the world of darkness now. Um, and then I loved Geist. I thought Geist was amazing. Yeah, that uh, was cool. And I, and I love the new Hunter's book. The new Hunter's The Vigil. Love it. Thought it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I did not like old school Hunter at all. Reckoning? Cause my, uh, yeah, because to that point I was like, yeah, it's the whole point is you are a monster. You're a monster. You're playing a monster. You are a monster. Be the monster. And then it's like, oh, and here's a bunch of people who go hunt monsters. And yeah. I'm like, yep. But you already you already gave us um, Project Twilight and the Arcanum and um, the Inquisition source book. Oh yeah, Demon. Who totally forgot about Demon? It was a really interesting game that they put out right before they closed the doors on the shop. So uh, it didn't have enough chance to actually develop, I don't think, or develop a player group or a love. Like, I bought all the books. We never got even a chance to play it. I felt yeah. like it was a hunter, too. Like, I don't mm-hmm. ever feel like it had a lot of time to really pick up or do much either. Yeah, I uh, never really played a whole lot of... Got into Demon. I have Demon, uh, and I've read a little bit of it. I, need, I haven't spent a long time, though. But I remember when I'm reading it going, this is dance the lore yeah. is so dance not in a not in a good way or a bad way it's just it, it's just There's as a, a lot as a way mm-hmm. and i'm like it, even from like Roberta werewolf because at least forget or bad the werewolf lore kind of expanded over like many editions mm-hmm. um and uh i was just like this is and i've got to play a short-term little mini uh demon the fallen game and thought it was amazing and demon the the new one um I don't remember the name. I have of it. Demon. no idea what it is. Yeah, yeah. That Demon one is just so rad. <laughs> uh, that is so radically different. It's it has a very nineteen descent. Sorry, uh, there we go. Uh, it has a very nineteen sixties Cold War vibe on oh, that's it, cool. and it's 
it's really cool. And I don't think it gets enough love because it's this weird, you know, it's so weird and strange, but I like it. It's a tough sell for people, I think. Yes. Yeah. I mean, all of the World of Darkness is a tough sell, but that one really doubled down on, let's make sure this is unacceptable to play. <laughs> you know, certain groups are going to just be like, no. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Like the new one, it's, they did the weird thing with the world where everything is like programs and like, it's kind of like fighting the Matrix a little bit. It's Yeah, it's, it's the Joker saying it's, bizarre. That it's like you're in the Matrix. Yeah, like God is a weird AI thing that is like, controlling everybody here like, ah. i feel like that was their way of trying to break it away from the christian mm -hmm. ethos of it like they were like okay look we've hit a little too close to the core on some of this stuff we got to pull back and do something mm -hmm. more abstract with it or we're going to be treading careful territory yeah we didn't do much of the god machine and that kind of stuff like i, I had kind of gone out of the world of darkness as that new stuff was coming in yeah. and i was so like I, we just haven't played it in probably who knows how many I, years at this point I, I will say yeah. for the for the re editioning that they did, I loved Requiem mm -hmm. probably more than I liked old school vampire for a lot of good well, reasons. I, I heard I, good things about it. Uh, I it love the good. whole the, the they added the, the five factions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Van, vampire was sorely missing that in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what's weird is, again, what they did was is they took Vampire and basically gave it werewolf's political structure because you had the you had your you had your breeds you had your auspices you had your your tribes well then that's kind of what they did with with vampire they're like okay yeah you're vampire and you got a clan and now you have a group and so it made that three layered sort of like identity where mm -hmm. which you know werewolf had all along but werewolf gets too confined in its military aspects that it a lot of that goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, when I was when I was toying around with you know, what we're gonna play and stuff, um, the other one I was really leaning heavy towards, and I and I kind of hinted that to some of my players that you know this may have been this was the other option it was um, the old spinoff Wraith game they did called uh, Orpheus. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I thought it was like no one, no one, no one talks Nobody about Orpheus. <laughs> no one gives any love. Let's let's give Orpheus some love, but. Um, no, it looks like we're going to be with uh, first. So we're doing the the first season of Werewolf, and I told I tease my players. I'm like, you realize I probably have about four or five seasons worth of stuff because we're doing smaller, short seasons. And they're like, they're like, we're all, we're totally good with that. Um, so <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, we have hit the end of our time slot here, so uh, let's let's make sure everyone knows where they can find you, what times you do your shows, uh, what sorts of things they can experience when they're there, and uh, you're on. Sure. Um, my name is Jonesy. That's what we've been saying. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ephanum. Uh, it's it's the word Menifee backwards. It's a holdover from my PlayStation days. Uh, it was my old call sign when I was a moderator on PlayStation. Um, uh, and I'm also on um, Untold Stories Project, where we uh, play. Uh, we're currently our new channel is running two games. Uh, I run the Monday night game, which is World of the Apocalypse, uh, mm -hmm. from 7 to 10, right? Um, Sounds seven, like central sorry. time, probably. <laughs> Sounds central close. time. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to like translate time, time zone, zone translations. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah. I thought you were on at 6 today, though, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is 7. Uh, uh, let me double check. It's so. yeah, no six six to nine uh, central six time zone. Nine central time here, which is 7 to 10 Eastern. So, yeah, because I'm off in the West Coast. So, the West Coast. To, um, uh, where we play World of the Apocalypse, uh, we're in currently in season one. Um, and then, uh, second night, uh, Tuesday night is our um, Mutants and Masterminds game mm -hmm. run by Alex. He's running a, a dark new war monster hunter uh, esque golden age esque supers game set in the world of his novel. So, it's very cool stuff. Yeah, we've, we've got a chance to hang out with you guys a little bit over there. It's been nice. Yep. Yeah. And other than that, you can find me at a lot of conventions, uh, well, Gen Con mainly, um, where I run stuff for Grudon Inn, uh, when I'm usually Blue Rose and Mutants Masterminds, because Blue Rose is the game I write for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, so, yeah. Are you running anything for Virtual Gen Con? Um, I am currently trying to wrangle the freebooters and looking to see if I can slip a game in. So 
Uh, I'm helping. I'm helping the green running team right now because with all the stuff going on with COVID and the shifting to digital and publishing shifts and stuff, they're a little uh, uh, wearing many, many hats. So I'm helping their team a little bit, trying to coordinate the freebooters a little bit right now. And so I'm hoping to slip something in for Gen Con. Either it's going to be Mutants Masterminds or Blue Rose, one of those two. Awesome. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Well, I think. Um just some closing thoughts on world of darkness is that if you're going to get into the world of darkness, it doesn't matter if it's vampire, it's werewolf. The key is always just to focus on those darker elements of humanity and what those mean for the characters and how you can push them to an untimely demise. <laughs> you're playing it correctly. Then <laughs> that's, that's what you have to do. So, uh, what they're playing, it's right here. Werewolf, the apocalypse. If you're unfamiliar with the book, this is what it kind of looks like. They're actually using the 20th anniversary edition, which is an updated version. This is the old school edition right here. You have do you have the new updated version with you? Which I guess before I we go out of here, I should ask you because I don't know the answer to this. Did they update the rules in the 20th anniversary version? Uh, they they did some tweaks. They cleaned yeah. up some stuff. So I've got oh good both nice, and I've got yeah. the limited edition shiny metal version. Oh, oh boy. that's pretty Look right that. there. <laughs> nice. Because I'm that big of a nerd, yeah. Did you see the thickness on that book, by the way? <laughs> that one had some heft. That's, yeah, that that's... one does have some heft. The, uh, the old school one, it's it's really not that it's really not that thick. It was a yeah, that's about book. twice as the size. I guess they had a lot of stuff to pack in there, you know. So you had the lore yeah. and everything. That's yeah, they awesome. were trying to get as much in as possible, and then they ended up doing a, a second book that's just as big for all the other shifting breeds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Naturally, you'll you'll never have want for more options in the world of darkness. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and the only other big thing is, is uh, as he said, it deals with some of the darker aspects of humanity. So, if you do end up playing or, or running it, make sure you get your players' buy-ins before you drop some of that stuff on them. Yes. Make sure, yes. what, confirm what the comfort level at the table is. Uh, have an X card if necessary. You know, even if not, if you don't think it's necessary, still have one anyway. Yes. Um, uh, so that you know. Because you know, it, while it does go in some darker aspects, and I've dealt with it as a player, and I actually had the the, the the SD go, "Hey, this is where this is going. Are you okay with it?" And I'm like, "If I yes, I am okay with it. Thanks for asking, but I did put it in my backstory, knowing that I was mm -hmm. giving you a knife that you can stab my character with." Right. Yeah. And I, I think you know, I think X cards and consent, and a lot of that is a definitely a topic that we need to have a wisdom check on at some point so we'll mm -hmm. we definitely want to cover those things for people who are hearing this maybe for the first time and are unfamiliar with what those things are we definitely want to make sure we advocate them heavily for any world of darkness game because much like the world of darkness you do not know what you're going to find around the next alleyway or the next mm -hmm. corner <laughs> like it's it's all dark alleys and bad stuff could be happening anywhere so you know we definitely you definitely have to advocate for safety with the world of darkness because it definitely will try to push those edges yeah, always remember to show your you're uh, an adult and you're mature, and that doesn't mean be edgy. It means treat those things carefully. That's right. Uh, so we have a lot of shows we do throughout the week. Uh, rather than go through them all at this point and tell you, which usually takes us like 10 minutes to go through, just look down at the panels down below. You're going to see all of our shows. We have music shows. We have art shows. We have Pathfinder. We have 5th Edition Dungeons & Dragons. We have this talk show. We have a Zweihander campaign. Lots of stuff. And... Uh, Go check that out. If you are hanging out with us and you want to continue discussions, get to know the community, there is a Discord link there. Make sure you check that out. Uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, where we put up all these episodes. Uh, we have a lot of episodes for most of our shows. This episode that we just recorded just now will end up on YouTube uh, hopefully soon. I'll get that done in the next couple days so you'll be able to find it on there. Uh, right now we're looking to kind of develop that YouTube up. So uh, if you want to go over there and give us a subscribe, when we hit 200, we're giving away a book. So you got that to look forward right. to. And uh, if you're one of our subscribers, you have a chance to get it. And the other thing I want to mention before we kind of look for a raid target is we want to make sure that you are checking out the artwork of David Lee Pancake. Uh, he is an artist and he makes his primary living uh, at conventions. And he's a sculptor. And as you can expect with all the conventions going uh, COVID, uh, there's not a lot of income coming his way. So right now he is going digital with most of his stuff. He is starting a Patreon. He's doing Twitch streaming of himself sculpting, and he's got a YouTube channel with a lot of his work on there as well. So go check him out. Um, he uh, streams multiple times during the week, and he's been recently making our characters from our fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons world. 
It's been it's freaking cool. Been amazing to watch that process. Oh yeah, yeah. He just finished now, Kodo, and uh, Skeezer's pretty much done. It's gonna be yeah. awesome. Now, most weeks we would tell you you can just check that panel, and you'll know when all of our shows are going on. And then, of course, we tell you that this week when none of the shows are going on like normal. <laughs> so, just for a very quick recap, because we have to, Bardic Knowledge will not be taking place tomorrow. Cam is out on a vacation. There will be no Bardic Knowledge tomorrow. So, you know, there's plenty of other great shows out there in the TTRPG land you can go check out instead. Uh, we're back Wednesday night because Jeff's going to be doing DM prep for Pathfinder. It is mm-hmm. not a game session, it's his DM prep. But he has given you the opportunity to use your channel points to come influence what he's going to be doing for the game mm-hmm. session the following week. So just here where those changes are happening. Wednesday, I am making a special guest appearance over at Smart Gamer Network. I will be on Mask of Mimicry joining Bellic. Uh, we're going to be talk about alignment systems and the favorite topic. pros and cons of alignment <laughs> systems. Because it's one of the topics they want to talk about. So I was like, I can do alignment. Um, <laughs> so you'll be able to find me over there. Um, oh man, I lost the time on it. Um, just follow Smart Gamer Network too, and then you'll see me on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Jeff, you're going to be appearing on Air Lasers Channel Friday. Yep, Friday we're going to be doing uh, Monster of the Week. So I'm going to be uh, moonlighting over there. I'm going to be playing a character who is uh, just the bumbling guy whose stuff just always seems to be happening to. I don't know why, I just can't have a nice meal without a vampire or an alien or something else showing up to ruin my day. But there it is. <laughs> so that's going to be fun. Go check us out over there. And uh, I think that's everything we got for the plugs, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Awesome. Uh, oh, no, I do have one more thing. I forgot. Oh. I asked him, and I almost forgot to mention it myself. <laughs> so um, for Gen Con, which mm. is now virtual in like a week and a half two weeks whatever that is something like that 18 Um, days yeah 18 days i am officially signed on to be a gm for zweihander's organized play community that they're kicking off at gen nice well done Uh, i will be running game sessions it will be streamed i think on zweihander rpg Mm -hmm. i'm not allowed to tell you what adventure we're running yet but there is an adventure that we're running and that's been decided and i believe um I believe these games are streamed. I'll have to find out for sure. But I'm running a game on Thursday and Friday of, of Gen Con. So um, nice. I was going to do it in person there because they were going to kick it off there. And then mm-hmm. they've, now that it's gone digital, they're, they're getting that together. And I'm one of the, the GMs who's currently signed up to be running. So Untold um, Stories, hopefully. yes, I would be up for that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we can definitely do that sometime. Yeah, that, that's freaking awesome news, man. Very cool. Yeah, well, too bad we're not having Gen Con in real life. It's right in my back door. Oh, I know. Right over there. I can damn near see it from here. It's, uh, it's too bad. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it, was, it was a great conversation. Had a lot of fun with it. And uh, we'll love to have you back at some point. Oh, that was awesome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Plenty more to talk you, about, that's for sure. Two-hour conversation about werewolf and still not scratch the surface of everything there is to talk about werewolf. Like, no it's kidding. A, it's such a large, <laughs> complex lore. <laughs> we showed how big that book is, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely.